Hey everybody, welcome. Uh, welcome to today's Sunday stream, talking about uh, getting back to the basics on the XRPL. And yeah, so today we're gonna talk about basically everything on basics, accounts, the difference between an account and a wallet, and like interfaces like uh, XRP toolkit and Sologenic and things like that. And uh, yeah, we'll even get into talking about assets, trust lines, if you guys wanna do it, bit more discussions on the XRP toolkit, we can do that too. Um, yeah, basically there's a few things that I plan on going over as a general sense, and then we can open up a discussion and dive in uh, further from there. So yeah, thanks everybody. I hope you're having a great Saturday. And uh, I seen uh, XRP Crypto Beast, he wasn't able to join us. He's out playing golf, lucky. <laughs> but uh, yeah, how are y'all doing today? Kind of give it a few minutes here for uh, some people to start rolling in and so forth. I see uh, Thompson in the chat, Chris here. Uh, looks like XRP Marshall left a comment there a bit. Much. I think that one's a little bit older, so I'm not sure if uh, he's in the chat with us right now, but yeah. Anyways. Just kind of give it a couple minutes here for uh, others to start rolling in. Yeah. So yeah, I've, uh, anyways, I've basically just been uh, on Twitter there and seeing uh, some confusion coming from people in regards to uh, the difference between an account and a wallet and so forth. And I figured this uh, stream or whatnot would be a great way to touch on that because uh, as well, uh, seeing uh, people posting up an uh, address and it will end up being an issuer address. So an example of that was I had someone message and they uh, sent me uh, an address saying, hey, yeah, can you send me an airdrop or send me a tip or whatnot? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Uh, like, you know, but like I, I could probably send you a tip, but you, you're, you're giving me the issuer's address. There is a bit of a problem with that. Um, Please don't send that any funds. Otherwise, you're going to end up black holing those funds because, well, it's a black hole account. But we'll get into that further. So, looks like we got Big Ted in the chat. Welcome, buddy. Matt's go. William, how are you guys doing? Oh, we got Wesley in the chat too. Cool. All right. What's happening, everybody? So, yeah. Um, essentially, yeah. Uh, I just want to go through and clarify like some of the basics. Like I know it seems like for a lot of us that have been in the space, it seems like something that should just be, you know, common knowledge or common sense and so forth. But the thing is with a lot of new people coming into the space, they don't have any idea. They're like, Hey, crypto, what's this? Okay. And then instant overload. We've been there. Even when we first joined the space ourselves, it was like, it was information overload. And even now it still is like, sorry, my allergies are going a little nutty, but like, even now, like it, it's still information overload out there. Uh, like myself, I'm looking at the, um, the DeFi space with Flare Finance and all that and everything that's coming out. And like, I didn't get a chance to really do the, uh, the beta testing there. So a lot of that was still uh, information overload uh, for me. And so looking at that now, it's still the same way. Like there's a lot happening that I'm not like, I need to get myself definitely need to get myself up to speed with that stuff. But uh, anyway, so as a point of that is that we often take for granted the knowledge that we have. And so I want to do impart that on some of the newcomers into the space and maybe even some people that have been in the space for quite a while, but the connection there hasn't fully been made because I know like even myself, like I've been in the space a few years now and it wasn't until honestly, just a year, year and a half ago before like things actually started to click for me and things started to make sense. So that's kind of what I wanted to go over here today and bring uh, highlight back to the basics for everybody. So I'm, I'm sorry. I keep touching my face. I'm just, my allergies are going nutty right now. Um, I, I did take some allergy meds. Hopefully they'll kick in soon, but yeah. Um, anyways, um, 
We have a few more people joining the chat here. We got John A. Hey, welcome, buddy. Uh, Denusia. And yeah. So yeah, welcome, everybody. So yeah, without further ado, we got a number of people in the chat here. So let's sort of get started here. Um, now, I'm actually going to pose this out to you guys and see kind of the response that I get back. Um, I know there's a few of us in the chat here that are kind of well versed. Um, let's leave the answers hopefully open to maybe some of the newcomers here. Uh, so in the chat there, let me know. Um, to you, what's the difference between an account and a wallet? Is anyone able to uh, let me know that there? We'll go over that in just a minute. No problem, Jess. I'm, I'm happy to help. Like My whole point on Twitter and YouTube and everything is all about education and sharing the knowledge that I do have that I've been able to accumulated over the last couple of years and i want to bring that to a point where you know it's accessible for everybody so that's why i do the uh videos here so uh welcome john bell all right so not really seeing much in the chat there in regards to an answer so i'm actually going to go through and drop up to the board here and uh kind of break it down. So apologies. I am in desperate need of cleaning my office. Recently ended up having a flood and it sort of, uh, well, had to move a bunch of stuff around. So there we go. All right. So to break it down, let's start at the very beginning. All right. So the first and foremost, what we need to start at is the XRP ledger itself, right? So we'll just go here and we'll say, well, we'll make that a little bit bigger just so y'all can see it. So we have the XRPL. All right. So this here is the XRP ledger. Essentially, the XRP ledger is a network between like computers that all resolve to a cons like the consensus algorithm and so forth and all the transactions and whatnot get uh, correlated to the ledger here, which, you know, in other terms would be like a blockchain. So when it comes down to it and we end up creating an XRP account, okay, whether that's in ZUM, uh, Ledger Nano, uh, Trezor, Elipal, a uh, paper wallet, a uh, tangent card, at any point that you're creating an XRP account, right? The account is actually being created on the XRP ledger itself, okay? So essentially here, what ends up happening is, I'm gonna say here, code ward. So I end up creating a new XRP account, right? that account is created on the ledger. So while the action itself may take place in a wallet and you're given recovery keys and so forth, the account itself actually lives on the ledger, not in your wallet. So to explain that a bit more, basically, whether you have, as I said, a Zum wallet, Trezor, uh, Ledger, uh, Elipal, Paper Wallet, Decent, Kobo, or any other kind of wallet that will hold an XRP account, that XRP account doesn't actually live in the wallet. The wallet itself essentially just holds the keys and gives you signing authority, gives you the ability to sign the transactions. So what can happen is I can create an account in, say, Trezor, or sorry, uh, Ledger, we'll say. So if I have, uh, you know, my Ledger Nano here, right? I can create an account on my Ledger Nano, okay? Now, when I create an account on my Ledger Nano, that's gonna give me a 12 or 24 word uh, nanomic, right? So a group of uh, 12 or 24 word uh, recovery phrase. So that recovery phrase can actually be used in any other wallet. So you can actually, move the account between wallet to wallet. So I could move it from a ledger to a Trezor to Zum 
to uh, Descent or any other wallet that supports an XRP account. Okay, so essentially what ends up happening is a wallet is a form of interface, okay? So if I have here, so I'm just gonna draw a, there. Not sure if you can see that too well, but here, I'll make it a little bit bigger. So, There we go. So, yeah. So now we have a wallet, right? So this wallet interfaces with the XRP ledger. So the account itself has access to the wallet or the wallet has access to the account and passes that information through to the ledger here. So it kind of acts like a little bit of a middleman, okay? So essentially what ends up happening is you have your recovery phrases. You also have your ability to sign and transact. You also have a means of viewing your balances. And those are the basics of a normal wallet. Now there's other wallets like say some that give you increased functionality. So with some uh, via some of the X apps, it allows you to basically, um, sorry, like add uh, trust lines and so forth. You can also go through and create escrows. So if you're true diamond hands and you're like, I'm not touching this XRP for 10 years and you're legit about that 10 years, go ahead and create an escrow. You, diamond hands got nothing on an escrow. Obviously not financial advice. Like anything I say in here is strictly for education, educational purposes. This is not financial advice. I'm not saying or suggesting you go lock up your funds for a decade. Like that's, use, use your judgment. All right, a little bit of common sense. So just gonna take a look at the chat here. Hey, we got 4X Cadet in the chat. Everybody say hi to 4X Cadet. That's the man you wanna thank for the tip bot there. Awesome job, buddy. Like, the expansion of the tip bot is it's awesome we're going to touch on that later in the video as well because like that gets into you know apps and x apps and interfaces and so forth as well really cool x app if you haven't checked it out go to tipbot.tips actually whoops apparently i'm kicking over a vodka bottle okay so There you go. Okay. All righty, so Jess, um, so my XRP and airdrop coins are on my Zoom wallet. Um, I like being able to see them there. Do you suggest to have a tangent card? Okay, so I'll get into talking about tangent cards because tangent card basically gives you the, uh, like, essentially like a cold wallet, like a ledger nano would, but in the form of a card. So we can definitely, we'll definitely touch on that as well. So essentially what ends up happening is, um, to kind of step back a little bit here, is you have a wallet and then I mentioned here, or you did mention that like, you know, you have your XRP and your airdrop coins on your sum. Okay, so again, this kind of goes back to actually what we're talking about is that the XRP and the airdrop coins or the XRPL tokens like CSC, IGC, uh, LOX coin, uh, Bitcoin X, uh, all the ones that we're seeing coming out. There's a, there's a lot of them. I'm sorry if anybody from the other projects is watching and I haven't mentioned a coin. It's 
there's a lot. <laughs> um, for more information, check out uh, Gadget78's website, which is Gadget, G-A-D-G-E-T, 78.uk. There's a whole spreadsheet that breaks down all the information of all the different coins. It has a rating system and all different information towards uh, websites and white papers and so forth. Again, sorry, I don't mean to detract here. So essentially, I'm just going to pop this up a little bit here. There we go. All right. So essentially, as you were saying there, Gus, is that um, your account isn't like, some is an interface, it's a wallet, which allows you to interact with your account on the XRP ledger. So as I was mentioning, your XRP account lives on the ledger itself, right? And then the wallet interacts with that account. So while your XRP and uh, XRPL tokens do show up in some, okay? Essentially, they actually live on the ledger, not in your wallet. Your wallet just actually holds the public and private key, which then is an interface to allow you to interact with that. Okay. So another example here um, that I wanted to touch on is as well like interfaces. So um, say XRP Toolkit and XRP Toolkit is another interface that also incorporates uh, access to the DEX and so forth. So as well with the XRP ledger here, it also has a DEX for a decentralized exchange. And that's built right into the XRP ledger. It's not a layer two technology or anything like that. That's, that's built directly into the XRP ledger. So if you are a developer and you're looking for more information, you can go to xrpl.org and there's a lot of documentation to uh, take a look at there. Uh, Wheatse also has a whole bunch of uh, different tutorial videos that would help in uh, if you're looking to develop there. So essentially here, there's a bunch of different uh, interfaces for uh, interacting with the DEX itself here. So there's a few here from, well, Zum, while it is also a wallet, is also an interface to the uh, DEX there. There's also XRP Toolkit. Uh, there's also Sologenic. There's also uh, Gatehub. And as well, um, Bitstamp. Sorry, my uh, writing is getting atrocious. All right, there we go. So these here are all interfaces to the XRPL and the DEX itself, okay? So the difference between a wallet and an interface is that an interface basically is like a front end client that will show you the information, but you can't directly sign transactions and do uh, things like that. Right. So, with, so, sorry, that's, Zum is a bit of a, it's a wallet, but it also is an interface and it works in tangent with itself in that regard. So, Zum is a wallet and an interface. So, Take that one as a little bit of a one-off here, but in regards to like XRP Toolkit, Sologenic, GitHub, and Bitstamp, these are interfaces to the DEX, which will allow you to view your account. You can create like an offer and so forth, but to actually sign the transaction, you need to do that with a wallet. So more often than not, like some, like myself, I like to use XRP Toolkit and then to sign those transactions, I connect my sum account to XRP Toolkit. And then when I create an offer or uh, like make a buy or a trade or add a trust line or anything like that, the transaction request actually goes through to my sum account. And then I sign it using ZUM because ZUM is where I hold my public and private key. That gives me the signing authority over the account. Okay. So with that being said, is that essentially interfaces like wallets are interfaces, but not all interfaces are wallets. Does that make sense? 
heart. Hi, Benchmark. Thanks for stopping in, buddy. And uh, yeah, so anyways, so yeah, as I was saying, wallets are interfaces, but not, not all interfaces are wallets. So an example of that is like XRP Toolkit, okay? It's not a wallet. It allows you to interact with your account. You can see your account, you can see the balances, and then like it has other features like, you know, trading, creating escrows, uh, adding additional functionality, like turning a wallet into a multi-signature wallet. Um, there, there's a whole list of that. We can go over that in a little bit here. So essentially what ends up coming down to is that the common misunderstanding that I've seen on like Twitter and so forth is a lot of folks are thinking that their wallet, like Sum or their ledger is their XRP account but that's just where the private keys are being held. So with that being said, is that um, my wallet, like, so if I pull up my phone and I have some, right? Uh, Zum holds my private key. It gives me authority and signing ability or signing authority over my account. It's what basically lets me sign the transactions and so forth. So what ends up being is that a wallet will hold the key to give you the authority. An interface holds the public key, which will allow you to see all the information and so forth. But to actually sign the request, you need a wallet connected that has the ability to sign those transactions for you. Alrighty. So basically, yeah, it comes down that the account lives on the ledger itself, not in your wallet. The wallet just holds the keys to sign for the account. All right. So with that being said, I'm going to see here. Are there any questions with what I've explained so far in regards to accounts, wallets, and interfaces there? Sorry, just going to clean this up a sec here. There we go. All right. So yeah. If there's any questions about uh, wallets, interfaces, and accounts into what I've explained here, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll address them there. Um, in the meantime, we're also going to get in and touch on assets and trust lines. Okay. So if you have questions, drop them in the chat. For the moment, I'm going to start uh, talking about uh, different assets and uh, how trust lines work and so forth on the XRP ledger there. So as mentioned, XRP ledger is basically where, thank you very much, Supercrypt. Um, so XRP ledger is basically where everything lives. Like everything that happens, happens on the ledger. It, your wallet, your XRP toolkit, Sologenic, GitHub, they are all interfaces to the ledger, the magic and all the inner workings, all the cogs, all the, all the stuffs <laughs> happens on the ledger itself. Okay. So with that being said, we have, actually, let's switch this up. We'll go to a different color. Now. So with the XRP ledger, obviously the primary asset on the XRP ledger is XRP itself, okay? So XRP is the primary and native asset of the XRP ledger, right? Now, there are other assets that have been created. We've seen these coming in the forms of the trust line airdrops and so forth. Again, I apologize for my allergies. They're driving me nuts right now. But getting back to this at hand. Um, so we've been seeing a lot of these assets coming down the line here. And that could be everything from like, you know, CSC, uh, IGC, or in-game credit or iHunt. Uh, there's also, uh, well, Solo is another asset that's been on the uh, XRP ledger for quite some time. Uh, there's also other ones like CX1 or CourseX. Uh, there's also, uh, locks coin. Um, oh man, I need the list up in front of me to list like there, there's too many, but you, you get the idea. 
essentially there's a whole bunch of tokens being created on the XRP ledger itself here. Now, originally these were referred to as IOUs. And essentially what ends up happening is you'll have someone say like myself or another individual who will issue a new asset on the XRP ledger. Now this would be, um, this is done in a couple different um, steps. Like you would need an issuer account and a distribution account. So not gonna get too far into that because I, honestly, I need to brush myself up. That's uh, something I haven't touched on too much myself, but something I do, uh, I, I do wanna learn more about. So that's something that I'm gonna go and research myself later on. But back to what I'm uh, discussing here. So XRP being the native asset on the XRP ledger, we also have a whole bunch of other assets as well, like CSC, Solo, CX1, Malt, et cetera. Okay. Now these essentially are all tied to your XRP account. Okay. So as I said, your, here, so. There we go. Okay, so as I said, your account lives on the XRP ledger, right? And so do the assets that are issued. So what ends up happening is that an asset is basically another token offered on the XRP ledger. And that ends up being like, so automatically, apparently I can't spell. Um, so we end up having, so XRP, when you create an account, you automatically have XRP tied to your account because that's a native asset of the XRP ledger. Um, what you can also end up doing is adding a trust line or an asset uh, to your account there. Now, this is basically offering up a, um, sorry, a line of trust for lack of a better word, um, is basically saying that I give my account access and authorization to interact with another uh, asset. So in this case, we'll say CSC or Casino Coin. So now my account can now interact with both XRP and Casino Coin, right? Now, the thing is, that, and this is what I've seen is that there's a number of people on Twitter that are posting up the issuing account of Casino Coin saying that that's their address because like they go into the events and they see the trust line ad and they see this address and they're like, oh, that must be my address. No, um, the thing is, um, in with the XRP accounts, your XRP account uses the same address for all assets. So it doesn't matter if it's XRP, CSC, Solo, IGC, Logs, or any of those assets. All XRPL assets use the same address. So if you're in your ZUM account and you open up ZUM, right up at the very top, you have an R address, your XRP address. That XRP address is the same deposit, like that, that's the same address that you would use for all assets within your account. So that's not specific to some, like even if you were to turn around and take the XRP account, move it off into Ledger, like load it up in your Ledger Nano. Right now there's not support for XRPL tokens. However, what you can do is pull your XRP account into Ledger and you can still send those assets over to the XRP account. They just won't show up in Ledger Live then um, until XRP token or yeah, XRPL tokens are uh, supported properly. But so this is a perfect example of how the address is the sorry focal point of your account. So it doesn't matter if the account is on a device that doesn't have access to the XRPL tokens, you can still send tokens over to that account just using that primary XRP address. So with that being said, is that if you do uh, go through and you send tokens to an issuing account, like say you send CSE to the issuing account, the issuing account is black hole, which means it can't create funds like you can't mint more coins, you can't sign transactions. And as a result, any funds sent to it are lost. They're black hole. That's why it's called a black hole account. Okay. So again, I apologize for my allergies, but uh, 
Yeah, so essentially here, and I'm gonna fix this because this is driving my a little bit of OCD nuts. Um, there we go. All right, so let's check in here. All right, perfect. So, all right. So now we have our account. It has assets and trust lines. So different assets, as I said, live on the XRP ledger and these can be created by you, me, a company or whoever else. So like we've even seen say Jungle Link, he created a Jungle Coin back in the day. That's an asset on the XRP ledger. You can create a trust line for it and you can interact with Jungle Coin if you want. Um, I'm not sure if there's a standing of that token. I'd have to look into that. But it's a perfect example. Like anybody can create an asset on the XRP ledger. It's an open source ledger. Anybody can do anything. You want to create a trading bot and you know how to create it, by all means. You want to develop an X app or uh, even a website that interacts with the XRP ledger. Or if you want to create a um, an e-commerce site that, you know, we say we all created a WordPress plugin for, or well, updated the WooCommerce plugin to be able to accept uh, XRP payments. And so, yeah, there's many different ways to interact with Ledger. And oh, as it's open source, anybody can do so. And that's what I keep saying and coming back to is that if you have the ability to create something, go for it. Like the more development and adoption that we see in the space, it's just going to snowball. Like, and it, it, that's even how it comes to with uh, liquidity on the decks. Liquidity begets liquidity. Adoption begets more adoption. You know, it's like Amazon back in the day that started out as books. Well, people started buying books and then they requested, well, I want to buy books, but I want to also want to buy this. So, you know, adoption, storm snowballed and now we have a full like i don't even know what to classify amazon as now like insane but getting away from what i'm saying so when it comes to assets and trust lines on your account essentially what ends up happening is when you add a trust line you're extending a line of trust to that asset saying yes i want to interact with that and as such you can also set limits so if you want the um, trust line added you can put the value of zero and you can make it so nobody can send you that token. You just want to have that line of trust. Not sure exactly what you would do that for, but it's possible. And as such, like obviously most of us want to interact with it. So we just set the limit of it, like usually at whatever the maximum supply is so that there's no limitations there. Um, but essentially that's what it comes down to is that the XRP ledger is a full ecosystem. This is where everything and all the magic happens. Your accounts live on the ledger, assets live on the ledger, escrows are taken care of by the ledger. And essentially what it comes down to is that your wallet is an interface to that, to the ledger and to your account. And then as well, interfaces, well, as I mentioned, not all, or sorry, all wallets are interfaces, but not all interfaces are wallets. So as such, different interfaces interact with the XRP ledger and as well the DEX. So with that being said, you got to remember that basically everything comes down to the XRP ledger and the DEX itself. From there, everything else just kind of branches out. So wallets, I, I can create a wallet and it has no recourse of any of the other wallets like uh, some ledger, treasure, et cetera. You know, it doesn't even have to know they exist, but it ends up being an interface that interacts with the ledger, shows me my balance, gives me signing authority and so forth, okay? And that's basically what it comes down to, trying to kind of differentiate everything and break it down so that people can understand. Um, one analogy that I do end up going for is actually a bank account. And this is, I think this is a good way to explain it. Although again, some of it sort of gets lost in translation because it's not a one-to-one -one thing. So 
I'm just going to go and erase this here. Um, before I continue with the analogy here, is there any questions you guys have? If so, please throw them down in the chat. Don't be afraid. Like, if I see questions, I'll try to answer them and as best as I can and kind of break things down. Like, don't be afraid. Like, this, this is an education session for you guys. So if there's something you don't understand, you have a question, you want to drill down into something, drop it in the chat. Let me know. We'll take care. Like, we'll go over it as best as we can. Okay. So before I remove everything here, I'm just going to take a sec and allow you guys to drop a couple questions in the chat there, if you have them. And I'm just going to take a sip of my coffee. Okay. So... Just mentioned she doesn't have any questions. So, so far, is everything like pretty straightforward? Am I explaining it in a way that's understandable for everyone or am I losing people along the way at all? Like, feel free to let me know. Sorry, again, my allergies are going nutty here. All right. All righty. So yeah, I'm uh, not seeing anything in the chat right away. So I'm just gonna go clear the board here. All right, perfect. Thank you, Supercrypt. And so yeah, I'm just gonna clear the board here and we're gonna kind of break down the analogy. And so this will kind of break it down in a layman term, so to speak. Um, Jay, is there a limit to how many tokens can be created on the XRPL? No. Um, you like as it stands right now, if you go to zum.community, uh, I believe it's zum.community slash tokens here. I'm just gonna pull this up on my other machine here. Uh, zum.community. And then we go XRPL tokens. Uh, let's see. Just pulling up all the information. Okay, so right now. There is issued tokens. There's 5,904 different tokens that live on the XRP ledger right now. So there's a lot. And so, no, there is no limit. If you want to create a uh, token and you want to call it JCoin, right, you can create that right now. And if you wanted to have 70 billion or, you know, if, you know, if you wanted to, you could have like, you know, 10 trillion tokens, it doesn't matter. You set the limit. Like, mind you, kind of got to like look at what you're planning to do with the token. So I think before anything, before even the idea of creating a token is figuring out what you want that token to achieve, figure out your use case, find the problem that you're trying, like that you want to solve. Um, from there, you can drive basically what your uh, supply should be, or maybe uh, at least a rough idea of what your supply should be. Because like, if you just turn around and create a token and you're like, okay, I've got this token, but what do I do with it? You kind of, it kind of defeats the purpose. Like you're creating a token looking for a problem. The best way to approach it would be to find a problem, find a way to solve it. And if it uses a token, go ahead and create one. If you can solve that problem without you creating a new token, you don't need to create a new token. You understand, like you get what I mean. So, so no, in that regard, there's no limit to the uh, number of or however many tokens that you can create on the XRPL. If you want to create a coin called JCoin and give it a supply of ten trillion coins, you can do so. Mind you, supply versus demand, economics, tokenomics, and things like that will drastically kind of affect things as we've seen with some of these uh, airdrop tokens and so forth. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Nancy. I appreciate the uh, vote of confidence there. Um, Radio GUI. Um, yes, there's a lot of sites that interact with the XRP ledger as we're talking uh, here. Uh, XRPtoolkit.com, Sologenic.org. Uh, GitHub is a 
GitHub is a hybrid exchange. So they're like a centralized exchange, but they tap the decks for all their orders. Like all the trades that happen from GitHub take place on the uh, XRPL decks here. Okay. So they are like a hybrid exchange almost. So they're like, they're a centralized exchange, but they don't have their own order books. They tap into the decks for all their orders. Um, so in that sense, I would consider them a site that interacts with the XRPL. So um, if you're looking for more uh, developer related things like uh, documentation, check out uh, xrpl.org. And there's a lot of information available there. Okay. Um, okay. That's not coming up with the links. I should have added the HTTPS, but you can uh, just copy and paste that into your browser. Um, so to access GitHub, uh, you just go to github.net. Uh, Bitstamp, I believe, is also uh, bitstamp.net. Um, I do also have a video. Uh, let me just see here. Um, there we go. So I just dropped a video in the chat for you there, uh, Jay. And this one is called um, importing your GitHub account into Zum. So this goes from the very start. Like I, this was a brand new GitHub account I created. And it goes through everything from funding the account. Um, wait. Maybe not. Oh, wait, yeah. So I believe the... Yeah, okay, sorry. So there's two videos here. Sorry, my apologies. So the first video there um, that I posted is uh, importing your GitHub account into Zom. This is a brand new account. There's no funds added to it. It's, just, it's basically a XRPL account that hasn't even been activated. I just took the secret, pulled it into Zom, and that's basically how you go through and import it into Zom. Uh, the second video there that I posted is the uh, utilizing Bitcoin on the XRPL ver, uh, via GitHub. Uh, that goes into a bit more detail into funding your account, uh, adding the Bitcoin trust line and interacting with Bitcoin on, the gate, on GitHub and the XRPL. That can also be applied to other tokens, whether it's Litecoin, Ethereum, and so forth. It's the same thing. You add the trust line and through GitHub, there will be an account that you send your funds to. And then GitHub basically takes your Ethereum, Litecoin, Bitcoin, whatever it is, and it'll convert it to a XRPL asset, uh, basically an IOU. And essentially what ends up happening is you can transact with that XRPL or that uh, IOU on the DEX there. So you'll see via like GitHub or sorry, well, yeah, GitHub, uh, XRPL. P toolkit and Sologenic, you can trade Bitcoin on the XRPL. And it's just using the uh, basically a IOU or a Bitcoin token that's wrapped on the XRP ledger there. So with that being said, like the utilizing or the second video there, uh, utilizing uh, Bitcoin on the XRPL, that gets into basically on-ramping, off-ramping. It also gets into trading uh, across different aspects of using the GitHub website, uh, the GitHub trade exop within Zum. It also touches on uh, trading with uh, XRP toolkit and so forth there. So that video is actually quite informative if you're looking into using like wrap tokens is basically what it'd be called. So Bitcoin gets wrapped, it's an IOU on the XRP ledger. So uh, yeah, feel free to check those videos out uh, if you want there. They're, they should cover, I believe, the questions that you're looking to ask there. So yeah, and exactly, the transaction fee is low. When you're trading on the XRPL DAX, it's the network fee. You pay 12 drops, like 0.000012 XRP per transaction. Mind you, yes, there is a, well, actually, I think with the reserve update, it's now two XRP to post a trade. And then once the trade is completed, like filled or killed, that two XRP is put, like it's reserved. And then once the trade's done, that goes back to being part of your available balance. So the XRP never actually leaves your account. It's just 
taken away from the available balance and held in reserve, if that makes sense. All right, so I got a couple questions here from uh, Big Ted. Uh, I bought some coins on XRP Toolkit and I used Zoom Wallet to sign the transaction. I bought so much on a limit order and I must not have enough XRP in Zoom and I owed about 35 XRP. Because every time I would add it. Okay. That, that is a bit odd. I've never seen a, I've never seen a, a, a balance owing like that. Uh, usually, as far as I understand, it would be, um, basically it would fill up to the available amount that you had. Um, owing, I'll have to look into that big Ted. That, that's a new one to me. I. If that is that, that's something new to me. I'll I'll definitely have to look into that and get back to you about that. Okay, but um, I got to do a bit more research to uh, kind of get that sorted out. Um, okay. So now we got another question from Jess here. So I saw some info on Global ID, downloaded the app, but I'm not sure I want to link my Zoom wallet to that. What's your take on that? Um, it's, this is a kind of a gray area. Well, not a gray area, but this is a area that's open to discussion and debates, uh, just as um, it gets into identifying and verifying like uh, KYC. So saying that this account belongs to me, I am a person, this is my verifiable information, I have KYC, this is my account. And now for people who are, uh, say, trying to do some shady stuff, they're going to avoid that like the plague. Um, if you're doing stuff and you're not, like if you're doing stuff legitimately and you're not like, you know, trying to circumvent tax laws or, you know, doing uh, stuff that, you know, could be labeled as criminal or anything like that, then it comes down to a point of it's just basically a verification saying that I own this account. Creepy. Um, that I own this account, this is my account and I can, be ver I can verify it. Now, this will prove beneficial for other apps and X apps down the road. So like the uh, casino coin lobby, okay? Um, I have an account that is KYC verified. Uh, like I've I've done this uh, myself for one of my accounts. And so this basically will allow, like with my CSC account here, I will be able to, once the CSC lobby goes live, I can KYC once, I can verify my ZUM account, and that will actually allow me to open the doors for um, access to multiple casino operators by only doing KYC once. So what ends up happening right now is if you want to go through and set up with multiple online casinos, you got to go through and KYC for each and every single one of those casinos. Using the CSC lobby, it'll be a one like KYC once and you will have access to a whole bunch of operators and any future ones that are added down the road. So this opens the door for um, verification and so forth and also to cover yourself for like tax laws and so forth. So like you'll be able to uh, go through and all that like the tax information is properly reported and so forth like that. So in that regard, it's highly beneficial. So it kind of comes to what end of the spectrum you're on. If you're uh, in crypto as a good actor doing things by the book as it should be, then you know what, it, it is what it is. Like it's a way to verify that the account is yours and to prove ownership over the account as well. Um, on the flip side of things, if you're coming into crypto with the say anarchist approach, I'm not paying my taxes and so forth, you're probably not gonna wanna do that because like KYC and AML law is bringing to the point that your account's now verified that like that account is associated to you you know, so that's kind of where it comes in. Um, 
my personal opinions on it, as I said, like I have an account that is verified because I do aim to utilize the casino coin ledger or casino coin lobby uh, in the future there. And to do so, KYC wants and have access to multiple operators. Hey, that's a plus in my books. Um, so yeah, uh, with Wesley's question here. So your reason for using XRP toolkit versus Dex available on some through GitHub because of the available trading pairs and custom pairs. Um, okay, so XRP or Wesley, uh, XRP toolkit is as well access to the decks like um, Zom, XRP toolkit, Sologenic, GitHub, Bitstamp, they all access the decks. They all use the same order books, right? So the difference is uh, some of them like Sologenic have implemented the pathfinding algorithm. So with Sologenic, you can trade CSC versus BTC, or you can trade CSC versus uh, Litecoin um, or whatever other trust line that you have. Like it'll go through and do the pathfinding algorithm where it'll say, okay, uh, you want Litecoin. Well, we have casino coin to XRP, XRP to BTC, BTC to Litecoin, or, you know, it'll go CSC to XRP to USD to Litecoin, and it'll find the cheapest uh, path uh, to go there. And so that's uh, another aspect that has been built out, which is the pathfinding algorithm. So um, there are different benefits to different um, interfaces here. So like XRP toolkit, it's basic bones, it's it has access to the decks, it has set pairs. That's it. Everything is paired against XRP. Okay. So if you wanted to go through and basically do your own pathfinding there, you would have to figure out and do the calculations of which way should I go. Um, where Sologenic has the custom pairs. Uh, GitHub and Bitstamp are much like XRP toolkit where they'll have the uh, predefined pairs there. So that's something you'll want to take into account. Uh, hopefully that clears up your question there. Alrighty. And so Jay, if a trade is canceled, um, going back to what I was saying about the reserve balance for creating a trade, um, when you create a trade on the DAX, it reserves what used to be five XRP, but I believe with the updated reserve of 10 and two, two XRP gets reserved for a trade. So when I do a offer create, two XRP gets reserved. Now, if the order gets filled, that two XRP gets put back into my available balance. Likewise, if I cancel the order, that two XRP gets put into my available balance. It's just basically a reserve to keep the trade open on the DEX. And it's an anti-spam feature of the XRP ledger so that we don't have bots and so forth coming in and just filling up the DEX with bogus orders. So it's actually a security feature of the XRP and the DEX itself to keep the ledger from being spanned with, well, bogus orders. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, Images, IOUs, Bitstamp also. Yeah, so, um, so there's a number of uh, different uh, IOUs or assets offered by different uh, gateways. So gates or yeah, GitHub and Bitstamp are gateways or on and off ramps. So with both GitHub and Bitstamp, you can create an account with them, send them USD, trade your USD for XRP, BTC or whatnot, right? So they are a way to on and off ramp in and out of crypto. Um, yeah, so um, basically what ends up happening is that yeah, like you can create a, uh, in say Zom, say you import your GitHub account into Zom, you can uh, trade directly from Zom using your GitHub account and you can you can do everything from one account on, an, on and off ramp trade and so forth. Like you can even send funds back and forth and whatnot and you can have your GitHub account in Zom. You don't need another account. Like you could, create the GitHub account, import the secret into Zum, and that be the only account that you have in Zum, and that's all you have to worry about. And then Zum acts as a wallet interface, which gives you access to 
for the Rex apps, like uh, once it launches, the CSE lobby would give you access to the pathfinding algorithm, uh, the GitHub trade X app. So if you're on the go and you don't have access to your computer to log on to GitHub, there's a X app within Zoom. That's the GitHub X app. Um, you could also use the direct in app uh, in Zoom exchange feature, which take note, if you're exchanging within Zoom using the, like you tap on the asset trust line, you hit exchange. This is equivalent to making a market trade. So take into account that like doing it that way, it, it's market, market buys and market sells. Um, yeah, so essentially if you use a different feature like say GitHub Trade X app, uh, XRP Toolkit, Sologenic and so forth, you can set limit trades. And that's saying that, um, so to back up, sorry, a market trade is basically saying, look, I want a thousand, or sorry, I have say a hundred XRP. Give me as much CSE as I can get for that hundred XRP, make the trade. That there is basically a market trade. Give me what I want. I don't care what I pay for it. Just give it to me. Limit trade is saying like, I want so much of X asset, but I'm only willing to pay this price. I don't want to pay more than this. And so that's more of a give it to me now, but I don't want to pay more than this. So if it costs more than this, just put my order on the books and let it sit there and wait to be filled. All right. So. Okay, Jay. Yeah. So that's exactly it. So um, when you were on the, you initiated a limit trade using Sologenic or Zum Wallet the five XRP disappeared. It didn't disappear, it was just put into your reserve balance. And so that's basically it. It's um, when an uh, order is created or whatnot, it reserves that XRP and it holds it just until the order's filled or killed, or well, killed being canceled. So, and that's just basically, as I said, the anti-spam feature of the XRPL and the decks there, uh, just to keep people from popping up and filling it up with bogus orders. So, um, all right, awesome. I'm, I'm glad you're finding this helpful, Jess. Like, yeah, like this is what I'm here for is just to basically impart as much knowledge as I can. So as I said, if you have questions, this is awesome. Feel free to drop them in the chat and I'll address them as we go. So I mentioned, oh, sorry, GS is in here. And how does XRP to USD work on the XRPL? Okay. so. As I was mentioning, GitHub and Bitstamp are on and off ramps or gateways uh, to the XRPL and the DEX there. So basically what ends up happening is uh, GitHub and uh, Bitstamp offer up a USD IOU. It's a one-to-one. -one. There's no, like I know how with uh, Tether, like USDT or USDC, there's, there, it varies from the US dollar price point, right? So Tether could be like one cent above um, a dollar. The Git, GitHub and Bitstamp IOU are one to one. It's 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 a one to one peg. It's like if you deposit USD, you get USD. Um, now, with that being said, it is again an IOU, uh, basically saying, okay, I deposit my USD on the uh, on the GitHub, right? So I send either a bank transfer or a SEPA payment or whatever it is there, and. Uh, Sorry. Um, and so basically what ends up happening is GitHub says, okay, we've received your uh, US dollars. Here's an IOU for the US dollars that can be transacted with on the XRP ledger. So essentially it becomes like a token or an asset on the XRP ledger, like these guys up here. So XRP, CSE, IGC, so on and so forth. There's also, so there's also a USD and uh, there's also a euro as well. So you can transact with euros as well. So essentially the USD becomes a token on the XRP ledger. So it's issued as a one-to-one, -one, right? So if say I deposit $50, I get $50 worth of USD. So uh, 50 USD tokens, right? If I deposit $50 and 49 cents, I get 50, 0.49 USD, you know what I mean? So it's it's straight one-to-one. -one. There's no variance of uh, being, oh, 
the the IOUs were uh, worth a dollar point one or dollar point zero one or whatever. It, it's not like that. It's like straight up a one to one relationship. So that being said, um, when you end up trading on the Dex there or on the on the XRPL, essentially what ends up happening is, uh, as we said before. Um, on say XRP toolkit or Sologenic, they all use the same order book. So when you have the USD or XRP to USD and it says, okay, so what's uh, here? Perfect example right now. Let me just pull up. So right now at this very moment, Bitru shows Yeah, there we go. Okay, so actually it just changed. So we'll just go with this. So right now, XRP is worth a dollar five. Okay. So essentially, being is that the USD token is straight uh, USD value. So uh, what ends up happening is it's not like a USDT or USDC, which varies from the USD. As in, sorry, I keep repeating myself, but uh, it's a straight value bank. So if I have $50 and 49 cents I deposited and I wanna trade for XRP at $1.05 and there's order, like say there's a sell order at $1.05, I can turn around and just make a trade, whether it be a market trade or I consider it as a limit trade if I say I only wanna spend half or whatever the case. And then I would get basically enough XRP to fulfill that $50 and 49 cents. So it's a straight uh, value trade there. Um, so with that being said, what ends up happening is, all right, so uh, GitHub offers the USD token. So again, what ends up happening is you send a bank transfer or a secret payment or so forth, and GitHub receives that US dollars. US dollars gets turned into the USD token, and that gets deposited into your account. So if you take a look at the video, the one video that I posted, which is the um, utilizing Bitcoin on GitHub, uh, same premise, right? So you deposit USD and or BTC, your Litecoin, Ethereum, and it gets converted to the corresponding XRPL token asset or the IOU. And so what ends up happening is it's just basically converted to a token that can be transacted with on the XRPL. So when it comes to a point that you want to sell, right? So you have a GitHub account. What you can do is hop on the DEX. You can trade your XRP for USD. And then say you have a secondary account and you're using Zoom uh, or secondary account in Zoom and your GitHub account is separate. Then what you would do is just basically on your, in Zoom, you trade your XRP for USD, and then you can either send the USD to GitHub and offer it, or you could even turn around, just send the XRP to your GitHub account, trade the XRP for USD and offer it. There's many different ways to do it. And yeah, so that's basically what it comes to when uh, transacting with like USD on the XRPL. Um, if you don't have a GitHub or a Bitstamp account, you're not going to be able to offer it though. So um, if you're in Zoom and you've never set up a GitHub account or a Bitstamp, you can hop up in Zoom, tap GitHub and add the USD IOU. And you can trade XRP versus USD all over the XRPL as much as you want. But that USD is going to stay within the XRPL ecosystem. To actually offer it, that, you would need to use a associated uh, gateway, whether it's GitHub, Bitstamp, or so forth. And so then that's how you would go about actually withdrawing that USD off the XRPL ecosystem is through a gateway like GitHub or Bitstamp there. So hopefully uh, that clarifies that there. All righty. Okay. Oh, sorry, Wes. Um, so, okay. So when it comes to uh, the different uh, services like XRP Toolkit, uh, Sologenic, GitHub, Bitstamp, um, yes and no. Um, to actually trade on the XRPL, 
or on the decks, the fees are the same. So uh, there's a slight variance. I'll, I'll touch on that. Okay. So like if you're just trading like XRP versus uh, CSC or any other asset on the decks there, it's all subject to two things. Okay. So the network transaction fee of the XRP ledger is just 12 drops. So to make a trade, it's 12 drops. Okay. That being said, some tokens do have an issuer fee. So like I believe Sologenic um, and a few others uh, actually have like a, I think it's like a 0.2% uh, fee. So even GitHub, uh, GitHub offers the Bitcoin um, IOU and they offer a, uh, they offer it to be traded, but the IOU itself, the issuing asset has a issuer's fee of 0.2%, right? And so basically what ends up happening is that when you make a trade for XRP versus BTC on the DEX, you pay the network transaction fee of the 12 drops, but then 0.2% of like there is a fee of 0.2% that goes to the issuer uh, for facilitating that IOU for you. And it's basically like the fee for them issuing the token and offering it to be traded. Um, so like casino coin, as far as I'm aware, there's no, there's no fee for, there's no issuer fee. It's zero. Um, with uh, GitHub, they're issued or their issued tokens, I believe, do have a issuer's fee. I can uh, actually pull that up here in just one moment. Let me pull up GitHub here. Uh, no, I'm not logged in. Okay. So just take a quick moment here. Yeah, and just need to put in my 2FA here. Okay. All righty, so. Okay, so I'm not seeing it here. All right, so if it's not there, then maybe it's via zone.community. Check out tokens, and we'll say BTC. All right, here we go. So, well, that would be something to have a, uh, more information on. Okay, so perhaps it's via Zoom. I can should be able to see this. Sorry, folks. I know when you end up adding a trust line within uh, Zoom itself. Um, so, like, if I were to go to uh, GitHub here and I say Bitcoin, add and sign transaction. There we go. Okay. So yeah, if you hop into Zum, okay, uh, there's, and you go to add a token. So say you go to, you go into Zum, you hit add token, clap, tap on GitHub, and you select BTC. Not sure. No, nah, it's not going to show it there. Sorry. Uh, maybe if I turn down the brightness here. Maybe. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay, so you can see here, there's an issuer fee of 0.2%. Um, so yeah, when you go and add a token via the, uh, say GitHub or whatnot, it breaks down the details of the token itself. It gives you like the issuer, the issuer fee, and so forth there. Um, at that point, it'll tell you if there's any fees associated with it. So that's, as I said, uh, basically the fee that the issuer takes whenever you make a trade. So if I send, even if I were to send you uh, the GitHub BTC, 0.2% uh, would be taken as a fee. If I trade it, 
0.2% gets taken as a fee from the issuer. And that's just basically so that they end up making a profit for offering you that asset or IOU there. Um, so essentially, no. Uh, different taxes don't have uh, different fees. They're just different flavors, so to speak. So XRP Toolkit, Sologenic, they both work the same way. They both access the same order book. Um, the only fees that would be associated with the would be issuer fees of the asset itself. So Sologenic offers the Sologenic token. And the Sologenic token does have uh, an issuer fee associated with it. So if we were to hop into Zum, uh, we can pull that up and find out exactly what that is actually. So um, let's just see here. I'll pull up an account that, actually, no, I don't think I, no, I do have it on that account. So we'll pull up this one and we'll say add Sologenic, add token. And okay, so Sologenic's issuer fee is actually 0.01%. So it's actually like 5%, um, the BTC issuer fee of GitHub. So yeah, for every, uh, what do you call it? For every one Sologenic token that's traded, you end up basically saying uh, one times point zero one. Okay. So yeah, so for every one Sologenic token that traded, 0 0.0001 Sologenic goes back to Solo uh, or, the, or the Solo team, the issuing account. And that's just basically their fee for facilitating Sologenic. And that I think would basically just cover their fees as well at that point, um, but yeah. yeah so uh, with that, basically said, so no, the DEXs themselves don't charge different fees. Um, essentially, they all use the same order book, which uses the XRPL, and the XRPL charges a fee of 12 drops or 0.00012 XRP, should be four zeros there, sorry. But anyways, it charges 12 drops uh, to facilitate a transaction on the XRPL. If the issuer of a token has an issuer fee, then that is charged in addition to the uh, network fee. And that just goes back to the issuer there. So that's not dependent on um, the DEX that you're using. That's dependent on the issuer themselves of the token that you're trading against or with. Um, Yeah, I agree. Um, if everyone were to reduce to using the DEX, uh, definitely, um, wait, might be handy. If everyone is reduced to DEX, can it handle all orders, business, et cetera? Yes and no. Um, currently in the standing of the DEX, the DEX is kind of like, it's, it's liquid in a lot of places, like say uh, XRP to USD and so forth or XRP to BTC, there are a lot of more liquid pairs, but there's also illiquid pairs. And those are the ones you see when you hop into ZUM and you say, okay, I'm gonna tap the exchange option here and I'm gonna trade, um, here a prime example here would be, if I go to this account here and I say, okay, so I wanna trade say uh, BTCX and I hit exchange. Yeah, there we go. So down at the very bottom of, uh, again, my screen's too bright. I'm sorry, folks. Uh, down in the bottom, it says here, the price is different or the price difference between selling and buying orders is too high. So basically what that means is that the DEX is a little like illiquid, meaning that the spread is too big. So the point between the lowest sell order and the highest buy order is too big to facilitate the trade properly. And so uh, Zum basically says, uh, like, look, the, the spread's too big. We don't want you to get a raw deal. So please hop onto like XRP Toolkit or Sologenic and use a limit trade. Okay. Because if we do a market trade, there's a good possibility you're going to end up getting a raw deal. And we, we don't want to see that happen. 
So, you know, kudos to the team for that. Um, so yes and no, like if everyone was reduced to using the decks, yes, I would say yes, because essentially liquidity get begets more liquidity. So the more we use the decks, the more we set limit orders, the more we provide liquidity to the decks, the more liquid it becomes, the more useful it becomes. And then we don't end up running into issues where we have the spread being too big because say we have market or like traders on the decks, uh, like I'm not a trader myself, but like, even if you were to set up like a, I don't know, like a market maker bot, right? You could set up a market market maker bot to play around on the decks and just basically trade against itself. And then it just basically buys low, sells high, buys low, sells high, you know, sells low or sells high, buys low or however you want to like, you know? And so, yeah, like the more liquid we make the decks, the more business and limit trades and so forth that we bring to the decks, the more liquid it becomes, the more stable it becomes, and the more that, yes, it would be able to handle everyday business. And so that's where that comes into play is that, yeah, like the more that we utilize the decks and put limit orders and set, like, admittedly, I have. <laughs> It's half a joke, but like I have a hundred XRP sitting on the decks right now at a sell order for a hundred USD. So technically, technically I'm providing liquidity to the decks at a hundred dollars for an XRP. You know what I mean? Um, well, that might not be realistic at today's current price, you know, down the road, who knows? But the fact is that limit order is sitting on the decks that does provide liquidity to a degree to the decks that, you know, if somebody runs up the order somehow all the way up to a hundred bucks, I've got an order sitting there uh, ready to fulfill that hundred dollar order. So yes, um, yes and no. So right at the current standing is that if we were to just dump business on the decks and say, go for it, I think we would see some excessive volatility on the decks that would probably put some folks off, uh, especially businesses and stuff. But if it's just like small things, like say I say I run a mom and pop, a mom and pop uh, convenience store, right? And I offer XRP payments via the decks and I've got people coming in spending 20, 30 bucks or something like that. Yes, you could probably facilitate that using the decks. But if you've got a company like say MasterCard or Visa deciding to just green light the decks for you know, there are however many, I think it's like 1.5 billion transactions per day. Well, that's probably not going to fly as, as well. Not unless there's the limit orders to support the liquidity. You know what I mean? So um, to answer your question, it's a yes and no. But it's also the no is also a yes, because as I said, liquidity begets more liquidity. The more liquidity we provide, the more becomes available because it could be, it becomes more enticing for other folks to join in and start trading on there, which then creates a whole snowball effect for liquidity on the deck. Sorry to keep saying that over and over, but trying to say it in a different way to kind of convey that. So anyways, uh, that being said, And okay, so Jay, are GitHub and Bitstamp centralized exchanges with access to the XRPL DAX? Um, so that's what I was mentioning before is that they're, uh, they're more of a hybrid exchange. So they are a centralized exchange in the sense that you would register with them, you sign up an account uh, to on and off ramp like USD and so forth. And like, you can move other assets like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and whatever, what other assets that they offer. Right. So, uh, in that sense, they are a central point for on and off ramping USD, euros, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and other assets on and off of the XRPL. However, the trading is decentralized because it uses the XRPL DEX's trading books. So it's, it's, it's a hybrid, as I said. So it's like centralized in the 
sense of on and off ramping um, non XRPL tokens, but it's decentralized in the sense that all the trades that happen are on the DEX. So even when you're trading XRP versus BTC, that happens on the DEX. So in that sense, it's using the decentralized exchanges order books, but to on and off ramp non XRPL assets, it's centralized in that manner. So in that regard, it's it it's a hybrid exchange, I would call it. Hey, no worries, Christopher. Welcome to the show. Um, so yeah. Um, what about Bitru? Bitru is a centralized exchange. So they have their own order books that are separate from the XRPL DEX. Um, they are they do on and off ramping. They have other assets like Bitcoin and so forth. And all that happens within their order books. So Bitru is a straight centralized exchange. Um, Sean, uh, once I turn XRP into USD, how could I put that into my bank? So as mentioned, if you if you have the USD trust line on ZUM and you trade XRP for USD, you would need either an account with GitHub or Bitstamp uh, to off ramp that USD. So what you would do is there's two ways to do it is one is you set up an account with GitHub or Bitstamp. And when you have the uh, associated trust line in ZUM, you trade XRP for USD, and then you send either the XRP or USD to GitHub or Bitstamp. And so say you send XRP to GitHub, then GitHub, you trade the XRP for USD and send it off to your bank withdrawal. Same with Bitstamp. Likewise, you could also turn around and take the USD from uh, ZUM and send that over to GitHub. And then you would just, from GitHub, off ramp that USD or Bitstamp and off ramp that USD to your bank account. So they have, GitHub and Bitstamp have uh, methods, whether it's a wire transfer or SEPA payment to cover USD or Euro. And you can uh, off ramp that to your bank account directly from uh, their services. Uh, you can't do that from ZUM or the XRPL directly. You would have to do that through uh, GitHub or uh, Bitstamp. Um, so yeah, that's how you would go through off ramping or conversely doing the opposite way would be your on ramping. So you could send USD to GitHub which or Bitstamp, which would then convert that to the USD IOU right here. And uh, then you could trade that USD on the XRPL uh, for XRP or other assets there. Uh, so that's how you do uh, about, or go about that there. Um, XRPL NOR, uh, when you merge XRP addresses within ZUM, does that mean all XRP addresses you have change to on it one address? Um, no, so uh, essentially what happens with the account merge is you have two accounts on the XRP ledger, right? And so the account merge basically says that to merge this account, you have to remove all obligations, assets, trust lines, any open trades, anything like that. So the account that you're trying to remove or delete is basically what happens to this account. It gets deleted. So. If there's any obligations, trust lines, open trades, anything like that, those need to be closed and closed out before you can do the merge. So if you have, say, the CSC trust line on the account that you're trying to merge into, any trust lines that you have over here, you'd want to add over here. So if you have the CSC trust line, you'd add the CSC trust line and then you'd send the CSC over. If you've got Bitcoin trust or sorry, Bitcoin trust line here you would add the Bitcoin trust line over here, send the Bitcoin over. Um, same with any other assets. Once you have all the assets transferred over to the account you want to keep, then you close out the trust lines and that'll uh, remove or release, sorry, the XRP that's in reserve. So for each trust line, it's two XRP. So if you have five trust lines, you're going to free up 10 XRP into your available balance. Right. So now, once you have all your trust lines removed, you want to make sure that you have any trades on the XRPL DEX closed up. 
So as soon as, like once you have all trust lines closed, all open trades closed, um, any, th any other obligations, um, escrows and things like that, you would need to basically close those out in order to merge that account over. That being said, um, once those are all closed out, you would then go through the account merge. And what the account merge basically does is that it'll say, I'm deleting this account, I'm moving everything over to this account, and we're gonna head and go, go ahead and do that. So what ends up happening is all the XRP that's left over in this account from uh, trust lines, open trades, any other obligations or, that require reserves, will be now in your available balance minus the account reserve. So then what ends up happening is everything gets moved over to this account, like all the balances. So what ends up happening is like including the account reserve. So now mind you, the account gets deleted and as a anti-spam feature of the XRP ledger, um, with the updates, two XRP is burned. So if your account reserve, as the account reserve is 10 XRP, you would have eight moved over from the XRP reserve. Two of that, the other two is burnt as the anti-spam feature of the XRP ledger. Then you would, it would also move over any extra XRP that you have from trust lines or trades or anything like that. So if say, after closing out all your trust lines and trades, you have a total of say 27 XRP on your account, and you delete it and merge to this account, this account would receive 25. The other two would be burnt as part of the account deletion process. At that point, this account is deleted. Um, with that being said, the public and private keys still exist, but it would be associated with an unactivated account. So you could in future turn around and re-import the secret key for the deleted account and reactivate it. So the account merge just basically pushes everything over to the account you wanna keep and it deletes the XRP account off the XRP ledger, essentially making it an unactivated account because to basically break it down, every account that can exist, that will exist, and that has and ever will exist is on the XRP ledger. There is a public and private key associated for every single XRP ledger that exists. Okay. Or sorry, every XRP account that exists. So essentially what happens is it just goes from an active to an inactive state. And more or less like the, when you generate the uh, public private key pair, it's just saying, okay, we have an account, this is the public private key, here you go. Nobody else should be able to have access to that. And that's where like David Schwartz has talked about, like the amount of accounts that exist on the XRPL, like it's, it's like turning around walking on a, on a beach, picking up a single grain of sand, dropping it down, and then having somebody else walk down the beach at some point and picking up that exact same piece of sand and that exact same grain of sand. It's like, it's virtually impossible or well, not impossible, but the level of improbability is like infinitesimal. Like it, it, the likeliness of somebody generating the same public private key pair as you is likely never to happen within your lifetime. So when it comes to the account merge, um, basically all it does is it takes account B, moves all the XRP over to account A, and then basically deactivates and de deletes the account off the XRP ledger. And deleting the account is just basically, it, it's inactive. Uh, there's no XRP that exists on it. It becomes a inactive account. It can't be transacted with. Still technically exists on the XRP ledger because you can re-import that private key and reactivate the account. But yeah, that's essentially what it comes down to. 
Um, okay, perfect. I'm glad I was able to answer your question there, uh, Wesley. Um, yeah, uh, exactly. And like the XRPL DAX, it, it's, it is going to come in handy real soon. Like I, I've said it before and I've said it time and time again. I think it's just a matter of time until centralized exchanges, whether through regulation or obsolution, um, just basically either cease to exist or they adapt. And by adapting, they will go the route of GitHub and Bitstamp, where they access the DEXs, right? And so what we'll end up seeing is we see already that like Ethereum has its DEXs through Uniswap or PancakeSwap or whatnot. I think what will happen with Ethereum 2.0 uh, will end up seeing much like the XRPL. It will, honestly, I, I think if uh, Ethereum continues on, it will have its own DEX built in. And so Uniswap and PancakeSwap and all these are basically trial runs at how to handle the Ethereum DEX in future. And basically the winner is basically what I think will be incorporated into the Ethereum 2.0 um, built-in DEX is what's going to end up happening, is the winner will take the cake and that's what will probably be used. Um, not like I, I'm speculating here. This is just guessing from a technological standpoint. Um, so yeah, um, and that's the way that I see it going forward in future is that there's going to be more or less like nasdaq so to speak like nasdaq and so forth it's all like it's it all ends up using the same order books there's just one big order book that everybody uses and that's where you end up seeing a lot of the uh, liquidity and sustainability in the markets is because it's just one big order book that ends up being used and that's what i think we'll end up seeing with other assets as well is that you'll end up having basically a glorified DEX that ends up being used that everybody ends up using, including centralized exchanges, apps, and things like that. Everybody will end up using the same DEX. At least that's how I see it going. Um, the continuation of what, the way things are going currently with centralized exchanges and the way that like, even with like the Songbird drop, how exchanges are just holding that back from users that from a regulatory standpoint should not be able to happen. And I think that is going to be something that ends up being addressed in the future there. So, yeah. Um, Jess, uh, what do I find more user-friendly, GitHub or Bitstamp? Um, admittedly, I don't have a Bitstamp account. Um, GitHub, I set up specifically actually just to be able to create a couple videos around GitHub and how it, or how it works. Um, I, I will look into uh, uh, potentially setting up a Bitstamp account. Um, I haven't done so as of yet. That's something that I do have to look into doing. So I can actually give a informed opinion on whether I find or which one I find more user friendly. Um, if you take a look at the two videos that I posted earlier in chat, uh, they are also available in my video, like my library of videos there. Uh, there's the importing GitHub account into ZUM and utilizing Bitcoin on the XRPL using GitHub and ZUM. Um, both those two videos should be uh, provide you with a lot of information on how it's able to be used. I get into like using the trade and exchange functions within GitHub. Personally, I actually found it quite intuitive, like GitHub quite intuitive and straightforward. Um, the only thing I really had to look into was... Uh, attaining like the private key to import it into Zoom. And that even only took me about five, 10 minutes to find the information on that. So actually, I don't even think it took me that long. Um, so GitHub, I do find really intuitive and user-friendly in that regard. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, Bitstamp, I will look into setting up an account with them and trying to find a bit more information on them in future. Uh, so uh, with that being said, yeah, I can't properly give a, a proper informed opinion on which one I find more user-friendly, but GitHub from what I found and via those two videos, hopefully you should find it pretty user-friendly and intuitive as well. Um, 
But yeah, if there's any more questions, feel free to drop them in the chat as well. Actually, what I'm going to do now is what I like to do is add the invite link here. And there we go. So in chat, I just posted the uh, invite link to the video stream here. So if you want to hop on and have a live discussion with me right now and you want to ask questions live, you don't have to have your camera on or anything like that. But I did drop the link in the chat there. If you want to join the conversation, feel free. Um, the link is there. When you do, um, if you do decide to join, uh, you will be added to like a little wait room until I just click you to be admitted. That way, if we're in the middle of a conversation with someone, it just we don't have somebody coming in with like a really hot mic or anything like that. And uh, yeah, it just kind of makes it a bit more streamlined process so that. Yeah, if, if you want to join, you can. Um, and that way you don't end up like, yeah, just coming in with a hot mic and kind of blaring the stream or anything like that. So yeah, anyways, um, so the link is in chat there. If anybody wants to join the conversation live here, by all means, feel free to. You don't have to have your camera on. Uh, voice chat's fine, that's fine with me. Um, yeah, by all means, come join the discussion. All right. So now when I was talking about uh, accounts, wallets, interfaces, and things like that, I mentioned before that I had an analogy for this. So I'm actually going to drop to the board here quick. And I'm going to clear this up. If you all want a screenshot of that, you can backtrack the video and kind of take your screenshot before I wipe it out here. But what I like to do in explaining things is I like to use analogies as it kind of breaks things down for a more uh, layman understanding. So when it comes to the XRP ledger accounts, wallets, interfaces, and things like that, a good way to understand it, like I like to use the bank account anal or the bank analogy. Okay. So We'll go through here and banks like money and money is green. Well, at least in the US, everything's green. Here in Canada, we have a rainbow of money or fives are blue or tens are purple or twenties uh, are green or fifties are red or hundreds are brown. Like we like our, yeah, we got a rainbow of money. So anyways, so you have your bank, right? And this is kind of where the analogy comes in. Is so for um, so banks basically offer a bank account, and this we would refer to as like your XRP account, right? So you have your um, so then through the bank here, we'll use a couple of different colors. Uh, you have your account, right? And this would be associated to your, uh, say, your XRP account itself, right? So we'll say XRP. Right. So a bank will offer you an account. And in that account, you'll have your, well, dollars, US dollars. In this case, you have your XRP, right? Now, the difference between a bank and the XRP ledger is your account can actually hold, or on the XRP ledger, can actually hold multiple different assets. As we were discussing, we got XRP, Solo, uh, CSC, oops, um, blocks, uh, you can even hold BTC, uh, Ethereum, and so forth, right? So basically, the bank offers you an account, your account can hold different assets, right? And so what ends up being is that, again, with a bank, you can have multiple different accounts. Now that could be like your checking account, savings account, things like that. And much like, um, in much the same way, you can have different accounts on the XRP ledger for different things that you want. Like, uh, like I have a HODL account, which has like all my long-term holdings sitting there. I have a, my tip bot, or my, sorry, my tip jar. 
right? And my tip jar is just just that for me, giving and receiving tips. Like uh, I'll tip people XRP, CSE. Mostly I tip CSE, but like I have like a whole bunch of different assets uh, added in there. So for accepting and receiving, so that like I have like XRP, CSC, um, oh geez, uh, CX1, Mox Coin, Equilibrium, um, Nerium. Like uh, I could sit here and go on about a list of the different assets that I have available in there, but that, but that's just my tip jar for interacting with people. So you could have different types of accounts that you use for different things, right? So some people will have, actually we'll use purple for this one. So you have different types of accounts. Much like with a bank, you have, you know, checking account, savings account, credit card, line of credit, you might have a mortgage and so forth there. Um, same thing that you, you can basically do the same thing with your XRP accounts, right? So you could have your, um, you have your HODL account. You have your, um, we'll call it like your tip jar, right? Now, so like your HODL would be equivalent to like a savings account, right? You have your tip jar, which is like your checking account. And then you have, say, your um, uh, how to say, like, you know, um, sorry, this is kind of where we lose ourselves in the analogy with the bank. But uh, it also have, like, say, a trading account, right? And like, and nuts as well, like banks offer trading accounts as well. Well, then you can also have like, you know, uh, an account that ties in and you have for uh, an account that you keep for like loaning for your family or so. Like I have an account that I have a balance that sits there and like, you know, if my brother's like, hey, but like uh, I need some money and I'm like, all right, well, you know what? I'll, I'll loan you so much XRP, just pay me back. So you have a loan account maybe, and that'll be like equivalent to like a line of credit. Anyways, uh, side the point, you kind of get where I'm going. So essentially you can use uh, the bank analogy when it comes to the XRP accounts. So you have a bank, which is essentially the XRP ledger. The XRP ledger can have an account or multiple different accounts. And those different accounts can hold different assets, right? And so essentially this is kind of how I try to break it down for some folks in understanding how the ledger works is that you, everything revolves around the XRP ledger, right? And so that's essentially the bank, right? And then the bank offers different accounts. And so that's where it comes through with the account. And as I mentioned before, is that your account has a set of recovery keys, right? We'll say recovery. All right. So now, um, when it comes to, your, oops, sorry about that, kicking stuff over. All right. So you also have a like recovery keys for your account. So like much like your bank account, if I lose my uh, bank card, right? I can go to the bank or call up the bank and I can get a replacement card. That being said, like if I have my wallet, like some ledger, treasure, whatever the case, and I lose the device, I can get my account back by using my recovery keys. And so that's the sense in the sense of uh, recovery, recovery keys being like your uh, being able to replace your uh, bank card there or your bank card being like a wallet, so to speak. So your wallet, even if you lose it, you lose your phone, you lose your device, you can still recover your account provided that you have your recovery keys. This is why recovery keys are so important, like your 12 to 24 word monomic or your eight to six or eight groups of six words and some or numbers, 
in some that A through H group of A, A groups and numbers. Those are your recovery keys for some. Um, if you did this uh, casino coin swap, your recovery key would be the secret key from the old casino coin wallet. Um, if you end up losing your phone and you recover your account and you don't see your CSE swap account there, I do have another video that covers uh, recovering that CSE swap account, either using the secret key, the 12 words, or a backup file off your machine there. So just something to keep in mind there. Um, there there is a video on my list there to help you if you do need that in future. But most importantly, like with any of your accounts, the difference between um, the analogy with the bank here is that your account, right, or your wallet, if you don't take down your recovery words, you don't have those recovery words and you lose access to that account, you permanently lose access to that account. Unlike a bank where if you lose your bank card, you can walk into the bank with your ID and so forth and be like, hey, I lost my bank card. I need a new one. And they're like, OK, here's your new bank card. You regain access to your account with the XRP ledger or any other crypto assets, Bitcoin, Ethereum or any other type of uh, chain. Your recovery keys are basically like your ID of being able to get access to your account back your recovery keys are the keys to the kingdom, so to speak. That's why like, you know, if actually perfect example, if you turn around and somebody takes your ID, like uh, uh, identity theft, right? Somebody thieves your ID and then acts like you and replaces your bank card and so forth. That's equivalent to somebody getting access to your recovery keys and basically taking your accounts, right? So that's why it's so important to never, ever, ever, ever give out your recovery keys. It doesn't matter who's asking. If somebody asks for your recovery keys, they are a scammer. Do not ever give them to them. There are applications like the Bifrost Wallet um, or so forth that you'll put your recovery keys into to restore your account. That is the only, and I, I mean like the only time you ever give out your uh, recovery keys. And you're not giving them out, you're putting them in to be able to recover your account. But if you're on Twitter and you have someone like saying, oh man, we see it all the time, the trust line bots, the MetaMask bots, so pretty soon we'll probably have the Bifrost bots that are basically like, a, oh, I had that happen to us here, fill out this Google form. And the very last question is put in your keys. Don't ever, 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 ever put in your keys. Your funds will be stolen. The recovery keys are the keys to the kingdom. And so in back to the analogy here is if you lose your recovery keys, you lose access to your account, plain and simple. Like that being said is like, if I have my account in zone and I lose my recovery keys, I can't find them. The first thing you wanna do is create a new account that you have recovery keys for and move those funds over to secure them so that you have the keys. Do not ever keep an account that doesn't have recovery keys. You wanna move everything over to an account that you can recover. Because as I said, if you turn around and lose your phone, your phone gets stolen, um, you know, you're at the gym and you drop a weight on your phone and it goes and like, you know, lights on fire, guess what? You don't have your recovery keys. All of that is gone, you, it, it, it is gone. So if you've like, I've seen it before where, uh, you know, people have everything stored on their phone and they're like, oh, my phone's safe. I've got, no, even myself, like I've got Otterbox Defender, like, you know, I can drop this on the pavement right now. And it's like, whatever, I'm not worried, but it hits the wrong way. And like that battery ends up going up on fire and toast my phone and I don't have my recovery words. There goes all my funds. So security is paramount. Always make sure you take down your recovery words. And there's different uh, ways to do that. Actually, um, I, I have to give a shout out here to uh, Arcplate, uh, Dave from Arcplate. He has a system here, just one moment, I'll see. I know I have them. Oh, I have them here.
Boo, boo, boo. Bear with me. Put everything away in this drawer. To ah, here we go. Okay. So yeah, I do have to give a shout out to Dave from Arclay. He's a dude from here in Canada. And he's developed these little metal plates here. Okay. Might be a little hard to see on the camera there. But for this one's for Zom, which basically has eight rows, which all correspond to the numbers that you're given when you set up your Zom account. So the eight groups of six words, or eight groups of six numbers, you can actually turn around and hammer into this. And this is a metal like um, plate that you can hammer in your recovery keys for. And likewise, this one is Vault, but this is as well, uh, we'll take the, so you have 12 on this side and then 12 on this side. And essentially what that is, is you can take down your 12 to 24 word nanomic and you now have a permanent storage for those words there. And there's a little sheet that goes along with it that basically corresponds a number with a secret word, right? And so you just hammer those in. It comes with a little marker and a stamp. So you just take the metal, like you mark your thingy down, you put your stamp in there, give it a hammer, and it leaves a ding in the metal that it, it's permanent. And you go hide it somewhere, bury it, He's also got solutions for uh, hiding places for it, which are like little picture frames or things that you can put around the house. And, you know, it's, it's a great solution for keeping your recovery words or recovery numbers safe. Okay. So if you haven't taken or haven't already, feel free to take a look at uh, arcplate.com. And um, as well, actually, uh, if you use... I have a coupon there, code board, all in capitals, C-O-D-E-W-A-R-D. -E you can get 10% off. Um, this isn't like a, this isn't a sponsorship or anything. I just want to give them a shout out. And, you know, if you got a chance, it, it'll give you 10% off your order if you use coupon code at our plate there. Um, but needless to say, um, yeah, needless to say, sorry. Uh, the Recovery keys are paramount. They are the keys to the kingdom. You lose those, you lose everything. Um, that being said, um, just going back to the uh, chat here, just to answer some questions. All righty, let's see here. Okay. So, um, GS, will you take a dive into Flare Network in future? FXRP looks interesting. Yeah, I I do look or I am looking forward to get a bit more informed on uh, Flare Networks and Flare Finance and how that works. Um, in the meantime, um, Mickey B Fresh or Mr Fresh Time has a YouTube channel, uh, as well does uh, Community Flare. So Mr. Fresh Time and Community Flare both have uh, YouTube videos that cover everything in quite a bit of detail. And I would say go check them out for sure. Um, that being said, um, they're also available on Twitter, um, at Mr. Fresh Time, at Community Flare. And as well on Twitter, check out uh, the real Patty XRP. And these are all three, like all are great resources for anything to do with Flare, Songbird, and so forth. Uh, they have a lot of information available and Community Flare especially is out there helping the community much like I do. Um, he's like, they're out there like helping people answer questions and so forth. So if you do have questions, feel free to reach out to them. They're very, very helpful folk. Um, but yeah. Um, in the meantime, uh, Mango Paradise. So I missed everything. Explain everything you said in a few sentences. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, let's see here. A few sentences. So uh, to break everything down from the beginning and to give a quick recap here. Essentially, everything to do with the XRP uh, ledger exists on the XRP ledger itself. Even the DEX is built into the XRP ledger. 
So when you create an account on the XRP ledger, okay, the account is on the XRP ledger itself. It's not specifically tied to the wallet that you created it with. So you can create an account with some, with Ledger, uh, with Trezor, Elipal, Paper Wallet, uh, anything like even uh, using um, ArcPlate here, using a 10-sided die, you can generate yourself an XRP account, go ahead, load it up into ZOM, activate it, and boom goes the dynamite. Like, you know, so the XRP account itself is directly associated with the XRP ledger. It doesn't matter what wallet you created it with. You can even turn around and take your account from Ledger, pull it up into Zoom, or you can take it from Descent, pull it up into Ledger, or whatever the case. Like your recovery or your recovery keys are what give you, um, are what basically let you recover that account into any other wallet. Um, Zum, I believe, is a bit more proprietary in the sense that that like they use the uh, eight groups of six numbers. And so that I think is directly correlated to Zum. I'm, I would have to look in to see if there's a way to uh, pull those numbers into being a 1224 word uh, nanomic. But regardless of that, uh, essentially the XRP account is not tied to the wallet that you created it with. It's actually tied to the XRP ledger itself. Yes, exactly. Um, the wallet just basically gives you access to the account. So you can get access to that account from any other wallet. And so essentially what it comes to is that you have wallets and interfaces. All wallets are interfaces to the XRP ledger but not all interfaces are wallets. For example, like uh, XRP Toolkit and Sologenic, they are interfaces to the XRP Ledger and the DEX. Um, however, to sign, like to actually perform transactions in those interfaces, you need to sign those transactions using a wallet. Hopefully that makes sense. And so that's basically what it comes down to was the general premise of the difference between accounts, wallets, and interfaces. And then we also get into discussion or discussing like the um, assets and trust lines. So your XRP account, the native asset is XRP. However, different tokens on the XRP ledger can be created like Solo, CSC, Loxcoin, uh, BTCX or CX1 or Nerium equip, Equilibrium, um, uh, however many other assets are out there. Um, so those assets are created on the XRPL. However, you need to extend a line of trust to them or a trust line to say that you want to interact with them, that you trust that asset enough to interact with it and you want it on your account to be able to interact with it. And then you can trade with that asset on the DEX like using like XRP Toolkit, uh, Sologenic, or directly in Zoom using the um, exchange feature or even the GitHub Trade X app. Now, the GitHub Trade X app, um, I believe, has predetermined pairs that you can use. So in that regards, it's a bit more limited. Uh, same with XRP Toolkit, it's limited to XRP pairings. So everything is like XRP to USD, XRP to CSC, Sologenic, so forth. XRP is the base pair at any and at all times. You can flip um, which one you want to reference. So instead of having XRP to USD, you could have USD to XRP or CSC to XRP. And it just flips the order about uh, in how it's presented there. Um, but yeah, uh, basically that's about it. Um, the one other thing that I did want to cover that I haven't covered yet is the difference between apps and like X apps. And essentially like apps will be things like that you find uh, online, um, like MetaMask, I believe is like a wallet app. Uh, Zum is an app. Um, I believe GitHub and Sologenic have their own apps that you can download. Uh, the difference there with an X app is that X apps are directly in ZOM. They're like an ADAP or a D app um, via the Ethereum chain, right? So within ZOM, 
I look at it as X app is in some app, but I might be off and it might be like an XRP app, but regardless, uh, basically an X app is a, like a web app that's incorporated within some. And we see many of these already in some via like, as I said, the GitHub trade X app, uh, the XRP tip bot. You also have the uh, pathfinding algorithm. Uh, there's the um, CX1 faucet. Uh, we also have uh, Chris or uh, Big CJAT there in chat. Give a holler if you're still here, buddy. Um, he's working on developing the coin dropper app, which is actually pretty cool. If uh, you haven't uh, seen much about that, uh, he has shared some stuff, uh, especially on uh, XRP Crypto Beasts uh, YouTube channel and in the XRPL community uh, Discord there. So if you haven't already, go ahead and check that out. Um, it's just bringing more utility to the XRP ledger. Um, yeah, not a problem, Mango. I'm glad I could uh, kind of cover everything up quickly there for you. Um, yeah, in the meantime, while I'm just kind of, I don't want to say rambling on, but talking here, feel free to post more questions in the chat. As well, there's a link there from me via the uso2web.zoom.us. If you have Zoom meetings, feel free to drop in and uh, have a discussion. Like uh, the, the, the chat, the stream's open here. If you want to join in and join the live discussion, by all means, come join. Um, that being said, um, yeah. So... Another question coming in. Yeah, by all means, bud. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, one question been wanting to ask you, not financial advice by any means as a pure speculator, nothing else. In your opinion only, what do you think the value of CSC could be for you? From I get asked this all the time <laughs> and I'm being straight honest. Like I have no idea. Like I speculate in the, pri or I speculate in the premise that yes, I believe CSC will go up. Do I have an idea of where it will go to? No. Like my whole thing that I say to everybody is like, you know what, let's, let's focus on getting to like one cent and then going from there. Like, you know what, the project is all about sustainable growth, right? So I think what will end up happening is once we have utility actually rolled out via like the CSC lobby mm -hmm. and either other, or even in other aspects like, um, say people uh, develop other apps and so forth that actually use CSC, we will see a, a growth in that, right? So it's all about supply and demand, right? So the more utility there is, the more demand will be. The more the demand, the less supply. The less supply, the more demand, and then creates the whole economical supply demand ratio and where we will see price appreciation and deep depreciation uh, based on utility and so forth. So say the CSC lobby gets rolled out and everybody's gung ho and starts using it and you know we'll see the price probably rise up. And then people maybe you know get bored of the couple of casinos that maybe start off and then we see dwindling usage and then a new lobby or a new casino or a new casino gets launched, we'll see another increased spike of usage, right? You know, so it all comes down to utility, supply, demand, and tokenomics is really what it comes down to. The more utility, the more we'll probably see price go up and so forth. Um, when it comes to my views of where I see CSE going, I, I honestly have no idea. Like I'm here for the long run. I want to see kind of what ends up coming up and what ends up happening. Like I am less focused on price as I am more focused on adoption and seeing the way the ecosystem evolves and so forth. And that's why my whole point and premise to doing like my Twitter account and my YouTube is all around education of the XRPL ecosystem is that I'm about education, like price and speculation is something I'm less focused on because as I've said before, um, setting uh, price predictions and so forth sets expectations. Expectations lead to disappointment 
disappointment, especially when price prediction and stuff don't get hit. We see that all over crypto Twitter. People are like, people get salty quick. And I've said before, like, I don't do price predictions because it sets expectations. And if I were to turn around and set a price prediction and I'm like, yo, like, as I said, like, if I were to say, you know, CSC is going to five cents or whatever the case, and someone's like, hey, that's a however many X increase from here, I'm going to bet house and home because he said it's going to happen. And it doesn't happen. And Buddy loses house and home and is out on the street because of something I said. Man, I'm going to feel like a slime ball. And I, I don't want that. Like, I want, I want to see the space succeed. I want to see everybody succeed. And that's one reason why, like, I stay away from price predictions. That's why, like, my whole point and premise is around education of the space. So I'll say it time and time again, I don't do price predictions. Once in a while, I'll put out, like, a little picture like i've had one before where it's like you know people buying csc at 0.003 cents and then there's like a couple people lined up and then you know there's one where people are buying at 10 cents and then it's lined up around the corner like you know it, it's to give an idea of the mentality behind people in crypto is that nobody wants to be first but once they see everybody else running for it and the price go up. And that's why we see people chasing candles everywhere. Like I've already, I've also been seeing it where people turn around and we're like, I don't want to say we're at the bottom, but like we're at a low on CSC and people are selling right now, chasing candles for other projects. And it's like, that's where people get wrapped is they're selling the bottom, so to speak. Not saying that we were at the bottom, but we could be, we don't know. Like CSC lobby could get announced any time now and we'll end up seeing things wrong. Like, you know, so it's it's hard to say. And that's the thing is like, Casino Coin is aptly, or is aptly named being that it's a gamble. Like there's no saying where it can go, where it will be a year from now, six months from now. Like, man, next week. We don't know. It could bottom out. It could go for a run. It could still take trading sideways or in the downtrend that we're seeing. Like, you know, there's no saying for sure. So in that regard, I don't and I I don't do price predictions and I avoid it at all possible. As I said, like I want to see organic, sustainable growth in the ecosystem. And so that's why I agree with Daniel and I say, you know what, let's focus on getting to one cent first and go from there. Like, you know what, it's not a race. Like, I know everybody's so gung ho and like even the last month or two where it was like, you know, we had a bit of a lull and everybody's like, oh, it's stagnant. It's game over. It, it's, it's done. Well, no, like things are still happening in the background that we don't get to see. And so, you know, it's all, it's about patience. It's, it's the long haul. Like when I bought casino coin, it's the, I bought with the idea that, yo, I'm going to be here for the next five, 10 years. I'm not here as a get rich quick scheme. Like I'm not expecting to roll out and drop in a hundred bucks, walking out with a hundred K. You know what I mean? Like, that's not, if you're coming in with that mentality, you're going to get wrecked. And yeah. Anyways. I digress. So also in regards to X app, can anyone develop an X app? Uh, yes, anyone can develop an X app. Um, however, it does need to be approved by the ZUM team to be available within ZUM itself. However, uh, if I'm not mistaken, like you can develop an X app and offer it up anywhere. Like you can develop a web app and have people interact with it using ZUM. They just scan the QR code and it loads up an X app within ZUM and you can interact with it within ZUM. The difference being is that um, a whether or not the X app is offered directly in ZUM, like the path, uh, the pathfinding or, or uh, sorry, like, um, like say uh, GitHub trade X app. That is offered directly in ZUM. It's verified. It's available in ZUM. You don't need to go scan a QR code to load it up. You can just load it up in ZUM. But me, I can go and develop a web app and offer that up in, for people to interact with using ZUM. 
A perfect example of this is uh, short the FOMO. He's got a three XRPL dot F or three XRPL dot dev, or is it three XRP? Give me a sec here. Sorry, three XRP dot dev. Okay. So he's got that set up. I believe he was working towards that being an X app. And so you can interact with that uh, via Zoom. If the X app portion is available, I'm not sure. I'd have to check in. It's been a little bit since I've been on there. But uh, you can hop up on there and interact with it. And like if there's an X app portion, you can load it up as an X app within Zoom and interact with it. It's just it won't be natively offered in Zoom. So yes, anybody can build an X app. The verification is basically whether or not it's natively offered in Zoom. Does that make a bit more sense? Sorry if I confused you there. Okay, so it would be great to you CSC lobby or even an X app you designed to be future. I actually I do have a couple ideas for X apps. It's just a matter of um, development because like I work nine to five. I'm also a father of four, and you know having a girlfriend, you know, my time's limited. Uh, so I try to do as much as I can, and that's like even my streams here. Like I work my streams around my girlfriend's work schedule. And then as well, like I, in my previous streams, you might see like my little dude will come down and hop in and, you know, so yeah. Um, like I do have a couple X out ideas that I'm looking to work on and develop. I hope to get working on those as soon as possible, because honestly, I feel like they would be, they could provide me with like, you know, an additional source of income that, you know, might prove to be down the road enough to develop more full-time on the XRPL. Like if I could develop just one X app that pr provides me with enough passive income to like not have to worry about a nine to five, and then I can just start developing even more stuff for the XRPL. I would love, I would love to do that. Like I have a couple ideas that are on the back burner that I'm hoping to get to. I actually just loaded up a tutorial uh, for developing a, an X app, and I'm going through and just kind of playing around with a few ideas right now. And from there, like the one I'm working on right now, just to get a basic under, well, not quite basic, but an understanding of things is like a, an encrypted messaging app that I would love to offer within some so that it's like, you know, users can turn around and I can be like, oh, hey, I need to send my brother a message and included in that message is a payment. So it's like, oh, hey, here's an encrypted message. Nobody else in the middle can intercept that or read it or whatnot. My brother ends up getting a push notification saying, oh, hey, here's a message. This is payment for, you know, you coming over and babysitting while I had to work one day. And there's an encrypted message included with a payment direct to his XRP account, you know? that I think would be a phenomenal feature. And that's something that I'm toying around with right now. With Actually, right now, I'm just trying to get the basics of the messaging uh, worked out. But yeah, like I, I do have a couple ideas for X apps that I'm working on right now that I look forward to hopefully rolling out in the future. It's just, well, time prohibitive. So hopefully one day I'll have the means to be able to support myself through passive income that I don't have to worry about a nine to five all the time and, you know, and just be able to develop stuff on the XRPL. Like that would be the life. I, that is what I'm looking forward to, where I can just basically be my own boss. <laughs> you know, that's the dream, right? Anyways. Um, so Jay asking here, uh, what are my impressions on locks, smart locks and smart NFT tokens? Um, actually, I... I have a, like my personal opinion is I, I like, like I've read through the white paper. I like the white paper. I like the idea. Um, I do want to see like more development on it. Like um, I do see a future in it. The idea is fantastic, at, at least in my opinion. Um, so 
I'm not sure if you've read the white paper, but essentially you have like smart NFT, which essentially is like an NFT for your PID or your personal identifiable information, right? So I can turn around and create a token that identifies me as me, right? That's smart NFT. Now you can also create a, or you'll also have the smart blocks token, which basically goes through for creating an NFT that identifies your device. Right now they're working on like smartphones, but down the road, they'll be looking at uh, doing uh, smartphones, smartwatches, basically any uh, device that has like a unique identifiable, identifiable signature, usually focused around an IMEI, right? And so then you have an NFT that identifies you as you. You have an uh, NFT that identifies your device as your device, right? Then combined using locks, or well, combining them, you now have a relationship that says, this is me, this is my device. I can prove now through blockchain, this is my device, you know what I mean? So now you have a correlation between yourself and your device and potentially other devices as well. So you could have, you know, yourself associated with multiple devices. Now, say you end up having your device stolen, like, you know, say you go to college and, you know, you left your phone on your desk and someone's like, oh, hey, nice phone. Guess what? Yoink. So the thing is right now is that you could turn around, call up your uh, service provider and be like, look, my device was stolen. I need to blacklist it because like, you know, like, well, there's either information on that device or I don't want people um, using my minutes or my texts or having access, like, you know, you need to blacklist that device. So then that prevents anybody within your service provider of reactivating that device under their name. You know what I mean? The problem being is that a lot of service providers blacklists are siloed. So if say like here in Canada, we have a bunch of different providers like Rogers, Bell, Fido, Telus, uh, Kudo. Um, oh, I don't even know. Uh, Virgin, there's a bunch you could go on. So if you're theoretically, say you have a phone with Virgin, right? Uh, you turn around and you have that device stolen, that person then therefore turns around and has a contact, say in China or something, and they say they ship that phone off to China. China therefore has different service providers and the service providers there don't have access to Virgin's blacklist. They're like, okay, whatever, you got a new device, let's activate it. Defeats the whole purpose of the blacklist, right? Yeah, exactly. So a smart NFT is like a digital ID um, and smart locks is like a digital ID for your device. Yeah, exactly. And it's all on the extra B ledger there. So then, yeah, essentially what ends up happening is that device gets a shipped off to China and somebody in China says, oh, hey, I got a new refurbished phone that's blacklisted here, but my service provider doesn't check that blacklist. So essentially what the Lockscoin team is looking to do is to provide a, almost like a decentralized blacklist system for uh, companies to use. Because a lot of what ends up happening is you have uh, providers that provide, or that end up giving incentive for other companies to use their uh, blacklist. But if it doesn't incentivize the other company, then they don't end up using it. And so there's not that cross, uh, cross communication when it comes to blacklist. So then you end up having somebody in China that ends up unlocking your phone and now has access to your device because it didn't get formatted or whatever, or, you know, or the bad actor decided to, you know, load up the device and now has access to your phone and was able to crack through your password or whatever the case and now has access to your device, now has access to any of your wallets and things like that on your phone, right? So it kind of prevents somebody else from activating your device on another service provider that doesn't verify um, against all blacklists, which I think is another regulatory thing that needs to be addressed there. So in my opinion, I 
I like the idea of the project. I look forward to seeing where it develops and where it goes from there. Uh, the idea behind the project, I think, is fantastic. Um, I do believe there is some hurdles to overcome, as with any asset and any project, there's going to be hurdles to overcome. We see that with uh, XRP. We see that with Casino Coin. Um, like, you know, even XRP, they're, they're dealing with the stuff with SEC and the regulatory clarity there. Um, we see that with uh, CSC right now and launch of the CSC lobby. There's things that they're having to overcome and hurdles they need to get past. So, yeah. Yeah, there's, as with any asset, there's hurdles to overcome. And that's what I say, like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not talking down on the project by any means, like every asset, every project has hurdles to overcome. And I do look forward to seeing where they are a year or two from now, or, you know, 10 years from now, and I'm using like their blacklist, and my phone gets stolen. And then I can pay somebody locks to get my phone back, dude. That would be, I think that would be pretty, pretty freaking cool. So, yeah, my opinion, I look forward to seeing where the project is a little, like, down the road. All right. Now, David, uh, no matter how much you warn them on Twitter, many people, when you see a trust line tweet, they will set it up and post their address for the whole world to see, regardless if there's an airdrop or not, and make a nice comment about how great projects and they know that I'm thinking about it. Yes, we are seeing this everywhere. And I talked about this in my last video is that like, there is a security aspect that is being overlooked by so many people when they post their address on Twitter. It's like, dude, like you realize that you just posted your address. You basically just posted your bank account information for all to see. They can see your bank, they can see your balance, they can see what other trust lines you have, the balance of those trust lines. They can see the transactions you make. If you have trades uh, sitting on the on the decks, they can see uh, um, the exchanges that you interact with. If you sent funds to BitTrue or you sent funds to Binance or KuCoin or uh, whatever other exchange, like not only do they see that you sent funds there, there's also a record of the tag that you use, which now means they can therefore watch transactions on the Binance um, or whatever exchange and watch for your trust line or your tag, sorry. And if they see their tag, they're in there, they can now therefore associate and say, hey, guess what? You sent funds to this account from this wallet. Therefore, I can reasonably deduce that that's probably your account. And therefore also double check and say, okay, well, I see that you send it to three or four different accounts, but this one has the most transactions that you send your funds to. Therefore, I can reasonably deduce that that is your account. I can now therefore watch your account and see where you send funds to, right? So there's something that people overlook from a privacy standpoint, when they post their address everywhere. And I've said this like in my last stream, like here, like, um, let me see here. I'm gonna just go ahead and pull up Twitter here. And then I'm gonna hop over here and I'm gonna say, share my screen and Google Home Twitter share. Okay, so I'm gonna pull this up here. Okay. And analog casino coin. Why not? Let's see. Um, so here we go. So we all know that people love to post their uh, address up on. Uh, let's see, is there one here? I would not be surprised if there is. Okay, well, that, I, I am pleasantly surprised. I am pleasantly surprised not to see somebody posting their address there. But like, give or take, like the majority of uh, tweets here, we see like somebody has usually posted their address. And okay, 
So it might actually take me a couple of tweets. Like I think people are starting to understand that you shouldn't be posting your address everywhere. So, uh, okay, this one, perfect. So this will be a prime example because it shows a 200 CCC giveaway. People are gonna think it's an airdrop. Almost, yep, yeah, there we go. Prime example. All right, so this person here, we're just gonna go ahead and copy their address. I don't know who this person is, but point of the matter is, and I don't mean to out them, I'm not trying to be, you know, in any way. You just go to xrpscan.com, pop in their address. I now see they have 68 XRP in our account. And then we can also pop down over into trust lines. And here we go. So now I see that they have Paleo coin with a balance of 10K. They have ADV and a balance of 500. They have some Love coin. They have some Zhang Gang. Uh, let's, oh, they don't have any CSC, but they got a Sanaya coin. They've got some CX1. They got Calorie coin. And that's what I mean is right there. You've just, I, I can, I can fully see everything that you have just because you posted your address. And sorry, let me actually just pull that back up. So this is what I wanted to say. So now if we go through, uh, you could probably go through their transactions here because here we see that their account was activated by Coins PH, right? So here we go. So just going through. Here we go. So activated coins.ph. So here is the activation. And I'm pretty sure we could probably pop up here. Um, okay. So, okay. My mistake. That one doesn't show their. Uh, uh, tag. So I'm not sure if, uh, let's see, activated, maybe it'll be in the transaction here. Uh, okay. So no, I'm, I'm not pulling it up, but like, like that's, if it was like another account or so forth, you like, like Binance or BitTrue or something like that, it would show the tag that it was, uh, funded by. And that's the thing is like, you could turn around, pop up in there and see that, you know, this person sends regularly, XRP to BitTrue using this tag, well, guess what? That information, it's a public ledger. Anybody with your address can see that. And that's what a lot of people are failing to see in that security aspect is that this is a public ledger. Everything is public. If you post your address, everybody can see that, you know? So security, 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 folks, like don't post your address. Like, another one like you know what i mean here's and this is just to kind of drive that point home like again like this person's got 48 xrp we can see the trust lines that are on their account we can see they have higher paleo coin calorie coin they got some equilibrium um you know they got some csc and whatnot and that that that's exactly what i mean like your information there, you just posted your bank, your bank account information for the world to see. Anybody who looks at that tweet, sees that reply, sees that account, can pull it up. This is publicly accessible, people. Keep your security in mind. Don't, don't post your addresses everywhere, please. Anyways, um, yeah. Agreed. Yes, that, that's correct as well, uh, Mango Paradise. And that's one thing I've addressed in one of my previous tweets as well, is if you're going to turn around and use the tip bot, my strongest suggestion would be to use a fresh account, like set up an account in Zom and fund it by an alternate means. Like even if you turn around and say, you know, go and like, because like you can set up an unverified picture account or whatever, right? So you could essentially turn around and say, okay, well, you know what, I'm gonna send um, a payment, like some XRP to say KuCoin, send that KuCoin over to the new BitTrue account and then fund the BitTrue or fund the TipJar account or the TipBot account using that new 
BitTrue account that's just, it, it's like a dummy account basically, you know, and that there is enough to get you like, you know, de-anonymized or anonymized, so to speak, to give you some pseudo anonymity. So in that sense, that personally is how I would go about setting up a, a tip, a tip bot account, create a brand new account and fund it from an account that either has high transaction rate that it could be being sent to anyone or anywhere, it doesn't matter, or, you know, set, a, set up a account with a service that has no correlation to that uh, tip bot account to any of your other addresses. That there will provide you some pseudo anonymity in regards to any other accounts that you have and provide that level of separation. So with that being said, yes. So yes, be mindful with uh, as well your tip bot account is like, you know, don't like, yes. If you, if I were to tip you or you were to tip me, I can see the account that it's associated with. And so, yes, you, there is a level of security that you do need to keep in mind. And as I said, if you want, the best way to go about it is to provide a brand new account that has zero correlation with your holding accounts. And this way it gives you that degree of separation so people can't see, like, so I can't just hop on and be like, follow the transactions. Oh, you activated it from this account. Oh, hey, look at that. I see your 10K XRP or whatever you have, you know? Okay, um, so no, you can't run two ZUM apps. However, you can have multiple XRP accounts within Zoom. So you can turn around and um, so say you, you already have Zoom, I'm assuming. You already have an account in Zoom, right? You can create a new XRP account in Zoom and that off the bat will not have any correlation to the first account. It will have its own recovery keys. It will be a brand new XRP account and like Zum doesn't care where the account's from. Like I can take an account from my Ledger Nano and I can import that into Zum and Zum's like, okay, whatever. It's an XRP account, cool. So if you turn around and create a brand new account in Zum, it doesn't automatically have an association with the other account, right? Zum does provide a layer of interoperability between the accounts. So if you do create the account, and you hop into the first or whatever, and you go to send funds, it will offer the other account as a means of a deposit and so forth, but you don't have to. And that is just a, a UI association. There, it's not associated on the XRP ledger. You know, does that make sense? So yeah, myself, like I have, I think I've got like four accounts in Zoom, okay? four XRP accounts in Zoom. I have my CSE HODL account. This account has zero association with any other account, okay? This is my CSE swap account. That is it. This was created specifically and only from my swap. There is no other transactions that exist on this account other than my swap. It is siloed from all these other accounts, even though it's in Zoom. Okay, I have um, my tip bot account, right? My tip bot account is a bit more, well, I use it for all my examples. The address is out there, it's everywhere. Like the, I don't hide it because anybody that I tip or tips me can see that account. So it's like, whatever, that's a public address. Pub anybody can see it, I don't care. You can see my balances. If you wanna, if you want like rate uh, XRP, yeah, I just want to make sure that it's the proper account. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. So this here, okay. So in Zom, this is my, my tip bot account, right? So I have XRP, I have CX1, I smart, smart logs, I have CSC and all these other assets. Like if you look at any of my other how-to videos and so forth, this address is everywhere. If you were to tip me or I tip you, this is the address that you end up seeing. So you can pull that up and you can see my account. This is why I, I, I'm not hiding it. Like this is, 
it, it's a public account. It's there. So um, essentially what ends up happening is like, so as I said, so I have my CSC swap account that is siloed. This is in some, but it's separate. Like it, it has no direct correlation with my other accounts in Zone. Then I have my TipBot account, which is what you see right here. This is public. Like anybody can see this account that I tip or tips me or like, you know, it's there, right? It can also be pulled up from any of my other videos, as I said. Then I also have my, another account that I call my, like my tip jar. And this is on my profile, like my Twitter profile that's associated with Paystrip. Um, this is an account that I'm using for a giveaway. Again, I have it publicly visible for transparency. There's um, XRP in there that uh, basically can be used for, uh, or XRP and Casino Coin that's going to be used for a merch giveaway uh, with the launch of the CSC lobby, right? And then I also have um uh, my gatehub account within my zone my gatehub account again has no direct correlation with any of these other accounts it's just an account that i used for the um videos of importing gatehub into zum and transacting with bitcoin via the xrpl okay so as you can see like i've got four different accounts two of them are siloed two of them are publicly like if people can see them like it's not rocket science, you know what I mean? So in that regard, um, you can have separate accounts within Zone. Um, so with that being said, uh, can you run to Zoom? Okay, so your other question is here, how do you register the second account for tipping? Okay, so if your Twitter account is already associated with an XRP account, you would need to disassociate that account. So you just go to tipbot.tips, and you just go here and go tip but not tips and all righty so uh da, 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 da. okay i don't have it set up here but um or i don't have it set up via the browser here but usually what you'll do is you'll have an option down here where it's like other options and then it'll be like register uh, switch accounts, deregister, and so forth. And so you just hop on there, switch your account, and switch it for the account that you want to be associated and sign the transaction. So yeah, as Forex Cadet just mentioned in the chat there, it's uh, one Twitter account or one XRP account per Twitter handle. So yeah, if you have a second account you want to use, you'd either need to unregister the first or use a separate XRP handle. Um, and that's the same thing via Discord. So Discord's the same way. Um, it does need to be registered separately from your tip bot, um, or your Twitter tip bot. So the registration for Discord and Twitter need to be done separately because they're two different registrations. And that's to associate like Twitter to your XRP account and Discord to your XRP account. Now, with that being said, you can use the same XRP account for Twitter and Discord but yeah, or you can decide to use two separate accounts for different, like you can use one XRP account for Twitter and a separate XRP account for Discord. But when it comes to one or the other, you can't have Discord with multiple XRP addresses, vice versa, you can't have one XRP address across multiple Discord accounts. Same thing with Twitter, one Twitter per XRP account, one to one relationship. You can't have many to one or one to many. Um, no, no, no. So um, again, it's the same thing uh, with Twitter. So an XRP account uh, needs to have the base reserve met and then the reserve added for each trust line that you want to have on there and to be able to be tipped with. Okay. So like if you're on, if you want like a basic tip jar or a tip bot, right, and you want um, just XRP and CSC, keep it simple here. Right, you would need the 10 XRP for the account reserve. You need the two XRP for the CSE trust line, and then a little bit extra XRP for uh, transactions, transaction fees. 
Um, that being said, once you're set up, then you're good to go. You can uh, tip and receive tips, okay? Uh, once you've verified your, or set up your tip bot account. And so via Discord, you do that just via the not or the command exclamation tip register. And that'll go through and the interactive bot will send you a direct message, which will basically bring you up here to sign a transaction. You sign that transaction and it associates your Discord account with that XRP account. And, and so, yeah, so the activation is done by you. You do need to have an activated XRP account. Uh, yeah, because like you can't activate an XRP account with CSC. The base reserve needs to be hit and then the trust line needs to be added. Um, okay, so do I simply have the main account switched on Zoom when registering? on Discord. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So uh, what you do is uh, hop into the switch account, select the account that you want to register. You, again, want to make sure that it's activated. So you need to have the base XRP reserve hit and the trust lines and reserve for the trust lines added. Once you have the account activated and the trust lines added that you want to tip with or transact with, then you would go into Discord or sorry, you'd make sure you would have it selected in some, and then yes, you would go into Discord, do the registration, um, sign the transaction with the account that you want to associate with, and you would be good to go from there. Then you can start sending and receiving tips. Yeah, no problem, bud. Um, like, I'm open to questions. If uh, people do have questions, feel free to reach out and so forth. Um, at this point, um, we are running close up to uh, about three hours here. So it's about uh, 3.45 almost on my end. So I'll look to uh, end the stream here in about 15 minutes. So, so if anybody does have any more questions, feel free to drop them down in the chat and I'm happy to answer them for you. Um, but yeah, um, that's basically what today's stream was uh, in regards to was going over the basics and so forth there. Um, so yeah, if you do have any other questions, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm available on Twitter via at code ward one. I'm also available in the casino coin discord via chat.casinocoin.im. I will put a link to both of those in the chat here. Uh, so, do, 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 do. so there's, oh, Okay, so there's my link to my Twitter there. And I'm also available in the Discord via HTTPS chat.casinocoin.im. Alrighty. And so there's a link to the Discord there if you're not already in it. So yeah, uh, feel free. If you have questions, I'll answer them as long as I'm free and I can answer them. If I can't answer the question, I'll at least try to point you in the direction of some resources that will help you or people that will be able to answer the questions for you. All right. Um, and yeah, likewise, just kind of pay it forward in the future. If you see somebody else that has questions and you can answer the question, feel free to help them out, answer the questions or point them in the way to the resources that they need. Um, this is how we grow community. And this is what it's all about is community folks. Um, and that's why I'm here educating where I can and how I can. So if you do have uh, suggestions for future videos, um, whether it be a live stream or even just uh, one of the how-to videos that I do, feel free to reach out and let me know. Like I'm here just trying to build a, um, basically a repository of information for people to fall back on. Um, and I know there are some videos that I do need to redo, like the XRPL Dex trading video, like the first one that I did. A, I got a new mic, which will make it sound a lot better, as you guys can tell. And B, in the original video, I'm still talking about the CSC swap being pending. So I want to update that in the sense that being with current information, at least. So, yeah. Anyways, if you guys do have any questions, drop them in down in the chat. I'll answer them while I still have uh, time here. Otherwise, I'll be looking to uh, close up the stream here relatively soon. 
And yeah. Uh, so just uh, again, recap uh, for people who might just be joining. Uh, to go over the basics of what I just, uh, discovered in the start of the stream there is that basically the difference between accounts, wallets, and interfaces and so forth is that um, everything, the magic, the magic of everything is on the XRP ledger itself, including the DEX. The DEX is built directly into the XRP ledger. As with accounts, an XRP account lives directly on the ledger, not in your wallet. Your wallet holds the keys and gives you the authority to sign transactions, but your account itself lives on the ledger. And that's why you're able to import your account from uh, Zum to Ledger to Trezor, LAPAL, Paper Wallets, and so forth, Decent, Kobo, anywhere that hold, is able to hold an XRP account, you can import that into any other wallet. So um, there's kind of the difference between accounts and wallets. Now, wallets, when it comes to wallets and interfaces, all wallets are an interface to the XRP ledger. However, not all interfaces are wallets. And an example of that is the XRP Toolkit and Sologenic Dex. These are interfaces to the XRP ledger. And with that being said, the interfaces interface with the ledger, but yeah, they're not a wallet. They require a wallet to sign the transactions. So yeah, again, so if you guys have any other questions, feel free to reach out. Again, my links are in the chat there via, I'm on Twitter via at CodeWord1, or I'm also available in the CasinoCoin Discord via chat.casinocoin.im. Um, XLPL Nor. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still going. I uh, had some more questions coming through. Uh, so I'm just trying to answer everybody as I come in. We had some late joiners, so I wanted to rehash. And just as I close out the stream here, I just wanted to do a quick rehash of what we basically covered today. So yeah, um, again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Otherwise, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or Discord there, and I will answer any questions that I can. Feel free to give me a, a mention on Twitter, send me a DM, like my, my messages are open. I, I believe anybody can message me on Twitter. I don't close that out to anybody. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out. I'll try to answer them as much as I can. Again, my time is like limited to a degree. Like I do work nine to five. I do, I'm a father of four and I also have a girlfriend that I do spend as much time with as I can. So, and I also have my own development projects, but admittedly, I spend a lot more time on Twitter and Discord than I probably should. So if you do have questions, feel free to reach out. And yeah, I'm, I'll try to help out as much as I can. If I can't answer your question, I'll at least try to point you in the right direction towards other people that can, or at least resources that may be able to help you, okay? Um, thank you very much, but I appreciate the compliment. Um, so yeah, if anybody um, wants, feel free to reach out, suggest future videos and so forth. Uh, that being said, I don't see any other questions coming through, so I'm probably going to close out the stream here. Uh, yeah, we're pushing on about three hours here. So uh, yeah, um, thanks for joining the stream. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for your interest. And I hope you guys found the information that I provided here valuable. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you're interested in uh, any future, or future content that I provide, give it a subscribe. It helps the algos and our algorithms. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate you all coming out and you know, listen to me ramble on and talk about uh, the XRPL and different aspects of it. And again, if you have suggestions for future videos, feel free to let me know. I would, I don't mind covering it if you guys have questions and suggestions. Um, with that being said, I hope you all have an amazing Saturday. Go spend some time with your friends and family. And you know what? I know we got some trying times going on with the uh, coronavirus and everything going on, but you know what? Do what you can with what you can. And you know what? Well, as I said, have a great Friday. I appreciate you all coming out or Saturday. Man, I am lost. Have a great Saturday. Thank you all for coming out.
and I hope you all have a great day. Uh, thank you very much. Enjoy, y'all.